Hello, Las Vegas. So I know that all of you are really good at your jobs. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. You probably drive a lot of productivity in your work, collaborate well with other people on your teams, keep track of the skills that you need, and in the best of times, you drive incredible amounts of profit and innovation for your companies. Unfortunately, these are not the best of times. So as we head in to the back half of 2022, what do we know about the future of work? Well, at the beginning of the year, we did a study at IDC to understand what types of challenges there would be. And really, what's going to be the core of what we talk about today is what are these challenges of hybrid work? And how do you address these challenges? And where do you stand compared to other people who have really managed to figure this hybrid puzzle out? Because it's not an easy thing to do. How many people here are working full time in your office? All right, we got like six. That's awesome. <laughs> Congratulations. That serves to make my point. When we did the study, we were thinking about all of the types of drivers and concerns that are really leading to this situation. As a colleague of mine said not long ago, 2021 was where we saw all sorts of winds of change. Lots of things changed. They've been replaced in 2022 by storms of disruption. So you have, for example, job unpredictability. In 2021, almost 4 million people a month in the United States were leaving their jobs. Today, people are concerned about being compelled to go back into the office. We also have the threat of COVID and the uncertainty. We're in a lull. Maybe it'll come back, maybe something else, monkeypox, you know. There's a lot that is part of our personal lives that's being brought into our professional lives. And of course, there's the economic volatility, the war in Ukraine, supply chain shortages, all sorts of other concerns around a recession. Will it happen? Will it not? So all of this uncertainty is driving the necessity for us to work in hybrid ways. So we wanted to know, before we even began the survey with Cisco, where do we stand going into 2021? No surprise, hybrid and remote models were top of the list. And this is very consistent with the research that we've seen. But these models require that we have a dependence on all sorts of other things foundationally to work. So that means we need to have intelligent digital workspaces where we can collaborate and we can come together. It means that we need to focus on the employee experience as a core part of the design thinking that we do to understand how we're going to transform our work environments. It also means that we need to shift, and we've seen rapid acceleration of moving to cloud-based solutions. And of course, the automation that runs through all of these things, automation, especially automation of workflows, is one of the top areas technologically where we're seeing growth in a way that is supporting the future of work, automating a lot of repetitive tasks so people can do, as my colleague Wayne Kurtzman likes to say, people things. It's good that people can do people things. And of course, the physical workplace. I like to distinguish between digital workspaces and physical workplaces. There's so much work that's being done to innovate, transform buildings that we're used to being in into real collaborative environments. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So what could possibly go wrong? You know, simple. It's all right here on this chart, thanks. Um, so let's, let's look at what goes wrong. Well, the challenges go across multiple areas. It's not simply a matter of fixing the technology. We have business concerns around productivity, and we have concerns around that flexibility of work from anywhere and security. There's a real tension there. 
And of course, how do we know that we are able to collaborate in an effective way and not just simply go through the motions? We also have organizational obstacles. These are some of the most difficult. We have to understand how we do effective teaming, how we're able to sustain culture. I often get concerns and questions from people who are saying, well, we've invested in all of this technology. 80, 90% have invested in collaboration technologies, and yet still, they don't know why they can't sustain their culture. And of course, being able to build trust. Part of why they can't sustain their culture is because they don't have a culture of trust. And finally, technologically. If you think about security as a foundation for all of this, it makes a great deal of sense. It also means that we have to be aware that these things are going to require investment and that we have to invest in the skills and the IT staff to support them. All of these challenges are ones that I'm sure everyone in this room can relate to. So let's dive in a little bit deeper look at some of these organizational challenges, because they're amorphous, you know? It, it would be one thing if we just could buy an app to fix our collaboration problems. Enabling teams to work together, measuring whether that's being done effectively, is something that is very difficult to do. And then being able to sustain the culture. When you've got people all across the world in federated work environments, how do we bring them and create a culture? What does it mean to be part of your company? How do you identify? How do you show up for work and be that person? That's what keeps a lot of C-suite members up at night. As well as trusting employees, no matter how much you see that remote and hybrid workers are very productive, if not more productive than when they're in the office, there's still that lingering doubt are they actually doing what they're supposed to be doing? It's a, it's a really interesting problem. And then looking at how we maintain skills. There's a huge drain in terms of the kinds of lost productivity because people don't have the necessary skills to keep up with all of the rapid pace of applications that are being developed to solve for our current challenges. So now let's look at the different technology challenges. In some ways, these are simpler. They're much more straightforward. But the reason I share this chart from the Cisco study is because what it points out is a couple of things. First and foremost, security is foundational. You have, with all of the different mobile apps and devices, that endpoint landscape being so distributed, security is critical. But it also requires that we have a whole myriad of competing costs and concerns, thinking about what it means to be able to have sufficient IT support. What kinds of skills will those IT support people need to have to keep up with the security protocols that they are responsible for enforcing? How can they look at a landscape and be able to have visibility into the vast amount of IT support that is going to be required? So let's look at this in terms of how you address these challenges. I think, number one, it's not, it's not optional. If you were thinking you could just put this off till next year, if you could cut your budget, if you could just stay steady state, 80% of the people that we studied in this Cisco study had work transformation initiatives that were either underway or had been completed. 40% have a technology roadmap, and they are implementing it to address work transformation. And, oh, by the way, zero had not done anything. So I think this gives you a sense of the urgency of the normalcy of making work transformation investments in hybrid work. So if we look at this from the standpoint of finances, of what your budget needs to be, we're seeing that 66% have a dedicated work transformation budget. How many here think you have a work transformation budget? Let's see. We've got some work to do on the work transformation budget side. <laughs> okay, so start there. 52%, they're going to increase their budget. 40% keeping it steady state, and only 8% 
are, not go are going to decrease their work transformation budget. Okay, that translates to over a billion in spending by 2024, and that's probably conservative. So let's look at where these investments are going to be. If you look at the technologies that are going to enable that sustainable hybrid culture, that nirvana state, well, it includes investing in things like digital tools to be able to drive creativity and innovation. One example from one of our IDC Peerscapes was a retail uh, manufacturer of clothing. They invested in advanced CAD programming software, as well as increasing their network capacity so their distributed workers could look very closely at in, in large pieces of fabric, make choices about what they were going to be making and how they were going to design their clothing. You have to think about the common communication tools and have presence awareness. It's not enough that we just get on a conference call. Right now, it's all about creating a parity of experience. How is it that we can feel like we're all together in one room when we're in different rooms, or when some of us are together and some of us are apart? And then think about those integrated workflows. This is the fastest growing area of automation that we have seen. And you think about it from a day in the life of a worker, a hybrid worker. They're looking at their experience from the standpoint of their endpoints, the workflows to get them connected from their home to their office, through the building, making sure that they're going through security checks, making sure that they're going through health checks. And then perhaps they need to get in and book a cube or go into a conference room. There are so many different apps today. Think about it when you went to make your reservations to come to this conference. Think about all of the apps that you had to use to make your reservation, to call an Uber, to be able to check into the hotel, your security requirements. All of these things start to become part of an ongoing workflow that gets increasingly complex and increasingly complex to manage. So being able to have these accessible tools that allow people to work in different lifestyles across different devices and different configurations is a critical component, not just of your technology landscape, but, be, but part of your human and cultural landscape. And then, of course, there's security. And I like to think of security as sort of a, an all of the above, please, you know, when you're looking at it, because as we talked about a minute ago, it's really part of an extended workflow from the mobile devices that need to be secured to the networks that ensure that people can get access at speed and scale and in a way that's going to have integrity over time. Also thinking about all of those work devices and the complexity of them as we go from one environment to the next. But what's important here to remember is it's not just a technology concern. If you build a culture of trust, if you have employees that understand that they are not supposed to put sensitive information on unmanaged devices, if they have a sense of company engagement, if this is part of who they are, they think about it responsibly without being told, without being micromanaged. Trust is a human and a technology problem to be solved. And then you look at the investments in those kinds of technologies that are going to drive productivity. This is an example of how we look at the stages of maturity. I would say the stages of investment in building a hybrid workforce that is in digital space and physical place. And I want to put them up side by side because I think it's important to look at how those things change. So from a digital workspace standpoint and the investment in the networking, the good news is that we're seeing a lot of momentum. You have 42% that have secure enterprise class access to the tools they need, the data they need, the people they need to collaborate with, all of the applications. There's good progress here from our research. Now compare that to the physical workplace. The progress is less aggressive, but it has momentum. 
We're seeing that people are starting to open up and look at what they need to do to reconfigure their physical headquarters and their branch offices. They're looking at how they start to move and look forward with a strategic real estate plan that's dynamic, that allows for them to have flexibility depending on what's going on with the economy, depending what's going on with their growth plan or the company. So you see that these things are hand in glove with one another, space to place and place to space. So last round here, where do you stand compared to those people who are leaders in hybrid work? Well, I'm gonna take you through a, a series of spectra that I think are really interesting. And think as I do, where do you stand on this spectrum? So we'll start with the people and the culture first. Those that are not really invested, the six of you over there, <laughs> those of you whose companies are not really invested in supporting hybrid work, well, there may be a best in effort uh, approach to making sure that the office is really in a good spot for employees to come in. The challenge is that many of these efforts are being done in siloed ways. They just put that as the remit of operations or just the remit of HR. And what we really need to be thinking about is how do you get all of those cross-functional leaders to be thinking about hybrid work collectively and in an integrative, systematic way. On the other end of the spectrum, we have adaptive, seamless, secure ways of collaborating. So, what the research showed us is that 46% will enable safe, secure work from anywhere, but less than half of those have reached that truly integrated hybrid state on the far right here. So what do leaders do? They help to build a culture of trust so that all employees feel that they're on a par, regardless of whether they are sitting in their home office or sitting on a tarmac on a plane or in a waiting room someplace, that they have the capacity to feel connected in a way that isn't second class. So then, how about the technology? What are we seeing there? Well, work transformation is really this stepwise journey. It's not as if you're on the left and you haven't done your work and you're behind the eight ball, you're on the right, you're perfect, you're good to go. It's about being able to calibrate what you need to do for your next steps. And we found that 40% had digital roadmaps in place, as I mentioned, but only 20 have implemented cloud and mobile first solutions. And I think that's critical, because if you want to get that flexibility, if you want to have that fluidity, if you want to have a culture of trust that is based on having access to the right tools and the technology and the people, you need to make that investment. But it's a stepwise journey, as I said. So wherever you're starting, there is opportunity to become one of these hybrid leaders. Well, what are they doing? They're making sure that the support there is for secure environments that are oriented towards hybrid work. They're designed to create that parity. And parity of experience is one of these big sort of marketing terms. And we have to think about, well, what does that mean? What does that mean for a day in the life of your organization? Who are the folks that feel left out in the meetings? Who are the folks that get to lead them? How do you give everybody a voice in making those strategic transformations and help them to feel included? So the next step, facilities. We talked a little bit about those maturity models. Those that are just thinking about how are we gonna reorganize to be able to implement a return to office? How are we going to think about physical buildings in new ways that take us from simply a place to work to part of our work journey? And more importantly, part of a larger strategic imperative to foster much more of an environmentally conscious way of working, a much more socially conscious way of working, and one that is guided by governance. It's not simply throwing a, that ESG term around and having people say, oh good, we're you know, LEED certified, we're, we're, we're good, thanks. It's a much more holistic way of thinking about facilities. And we see that there are 52% that are investing 
in traditional office space or branching remote locations, but this takes time. I've spoken with leaders at JLL, I've spoken at others that are looking at how to retrofit or recreate their campuses to be much more of an integrated and seamless experience for employees. And the momentum is growing and the pressure is growing to be able to think about buildings as not just being, say, LEED certified, but being healthy buildings for employees, being centers for innovation, that bring people together who are physically side by side, but also people who are in very distributed and remote places. So what do the leaders do? They think about the hybrid building, the hybrid facilities as something that is purpose-driven. I've done quite a few interviews with leaders who talk about how on the digital side, they create office hours for their senior leaders to meet with people. And on the physical side, they are creating very dynamic environments that can be reconfigured, that can be purpose-built and designed for building out those collaborative experiences. So now I save the sexiest one for last, policy. What's interesting about policy, sexy though it is, um, is that many people get ahead of the game. And if you remember, probably going back over these last two years or so, we were all gonna go back into the office in September, right? Then it was gonna be December, then it was gonna be March, then it was gonna be June, then everybody just threw up their hands and said, whatever. <laughs> then Elon Musk decided we were all going back again. The thing about policy is it has to be calibrated. So you may be at a point where it's just something that HR puts in place. What are the goalposts that we have to meet? How do we tell our CEO what it is our policy is? What's our recommendation? Well, I think we need a policy for now, not just a policy that is based on an ever-changing goalposts. But if our policy is based on understanding what that end user experience needs to be, then it is the right policy. But if our policy is ahead of where our technology is, if it's ahead of where our culture is, it's not going to work. And I think that is the challenge because many organizations may have a policy that is far ahead of what their technologies can offer in order for people to be able to effectively execute on hybrid work. Conversely, some of them have made huge investments in having access to collaborative tools and having access to the kinds of metrics that help you to understand how your organization is integrated or not integrated, how learning in the flow of work is progressing, how application usage is succeeding or not. And in those instances, that's good. But if you have a senior leader, and I've had many conversations, that doesn't think that employees are trustworthy, having access to that technology is not going to succeed. So what did our research tell us? 51% are building long-term hybrid work strategies, but only 31% they're limited to work policies. So I would really encourage you to think about this in terms of not just the minimum viable remote work policy, but being able to calibrate, because that's what the hybrid work leaders do. They align their hybrid work policies to whatever the maturity and the sophistication and the capability is of their culture, their people, their leadership and their technology, making sure they're calibrated, making sure they're iterative, and not something that just sort of written in stone. So what's the payoff? Well, those that do this well, they see 25% higher improvement in attracting top talent. They see higher improvement in business agility, in regulatory compliance, and yes, the holy grail, employee productivity. So there really is a payoff to making these investments. It's very much worthwhile. I think what is something to keep in mind, and I will leave you with this prediction from IDC, by next year, 70% of the G2000 will deploy remote and hybrid first models. It's because of all of the disruption that we talked about at the beginning of this conversation. And it's something that you can expect to see 
in a way that will help to engage a much more diverse workforce to help address those skills gaps and all of the challenges that we're facing in a very confusing time. So I will leave you with three questions. Are you in a position to know if your clients are ready to make this kind of transition? Are you ready to make this transition? And where will you need to move first? What will be your next focus point? I'd like to encourage you to take a look at this study in detail. We have an info brief for you to review. You can visit the operations center downstairs. And I hope you'll stay tuned because we're going to have a model to do an assessment so you can see where you stand. Thank you very much. Good morning, happy Tuesday morning, everyone. It is so great to be here in person with you all. And in typical hybrid work fashion, I'm also really happy to welcome you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, if you're joining remotely. It's great to have you here with us virtually as well. Uh, as Toby said, my name is Chris Story. I have the honor of leading the Networking Experiences team. That Networking Experiences team is comprised of there we go. That networking experiences team is comprised of the Cisco Enterprise Networking, that's the Catalyst and DNA Center, Viptela, and so much more teams, the Meraki teams, and Cisco's industrial IoT networking team. And when I started my Cisco tenure, I, I came from the Meraki team, and now I'm just so happy to see how we bring these things together to be able to do so much more for you, our customers. And our vision as the Networking Experiences team is to transform customer experience by simplifying powerful and secure technology. To do this, we bring together the strongest networking technologies in the industry and bring them together in new and innovative ways to deliver more value to you. And we are gonna continue to do this and deliver the best end-to-end -end customer experiences while we also enable the campus of the future. And while we work to innovate and, and bring that campus of the future to, to life here, you know, there, there are a couple of trends that we all see that are guiding the evolution of what we do here inside of networking experiences. The first is cloud. We all recognize the benefits that can be achieved by going to the cloud. You know, workloads, distributed apps, so much of this has already moved to the cloud, and that trend continues in so many different ways. You know, speed, flexibility, greater insights, all things that we see customers being able to get when they move certain things to the cloud. In our networks today, we have an amazing amount of data that we need to find ways to better tap into, to be able to, to bring insights into what we do, to guide ourselves, to help our businesses uh, uh, do more with what they already have. And being able to harness the tools like AI and ML to be able to do more automation is just so important for us all right now. In, in just last week, uh, I was speaking to Gartner and they continue to say that the number one thing that they hear from the folks that they talk to is IT resources continue to be our limiting factor in what we really need to be able to do. The more that we can automate our networks, the greater that it will allow us to take those valuable IT resources and be able to focus them on what our organizations want to achieve, what our organization's missions is. Now, we know that as we continue to innovate on our networking portfolio, we need to do that in a way that allows for more flexible consumption. We hear from you every day about how you want different ways to be able to consume our incredible technologies. We also hear so much about how you wanna to bring together the IT and the OT networks for some of the same reasons that I've already talked about, about the, the uh, you know, ability with your IT resources to do more, to be able to accomplish more, to have you know, policy and security that spans throughout your network, to be able to not have to cross-train so many people to do so many different things. 
And when we build and innovate on our networks, security is absolutely essential to everything that we do. Security needs to be built throughout the network, not just at the perimeter. And finally, we all know how much hybrid work in these last two years have changed the way that we need our networks to perform. We need to be able to rapidly adopt, connect anyone from anywhere at any time. So all of these trends really do lead us as we start to think about how do we move these amazing technologies that we have inside of the networking experiences portfolio to do more for you. And uh, it was amazing, you know, Todd's keynote this morning. Uh, I, know, I know for our teams, it, 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 it just you know, brought us so much joy to see all the innovation that our teams are delivering. And you know, we are looking to be able to, as Todd said, you know, bring more flexibility and choice without compromising power in what we deliver from our networking technologies. Now, within the networking experiences portfolio, we have the two leading you know, technologies in the industry, from Meraki, the number one in cloud management, to Catalyst. You know, just the iconic technology that does so much for uh, building networks throughout the world. And, you know, with Catalyst and DNA Center, uh, you know, you have the ultimate and most flexible, most choice, you know, the deepest heritage of all the capabilities that we have in our networking portfolio. And with Meraki, you can have that simplicity, that ease of management, that ability to rapidly adapt to what's being changed in front of you. And those cloud trends that I spoke about, that's true for all of us, right? We know that by leveraging the cloud, we can do more. It helps reduce the complexity of managing your network. It makes you more nimble, makes you able to respond to changes faster. It gives you access to data far faster than you've had before. And in general, you know, it just gives more agility to your IT teams and ultimately your users in delivering outcomes of what you need to do. Now, our goal here by bringing the Catalyst and Meraki portfolios together is to deliver a more agile IT platform. Innovation can happen faster for your organization when we do this. And by bringing Catalyst and bringing cloud management to the Catalyst portfolio, you know, we want to accelerate your transition to the cloud. Again, to bring those benefits, more agile, more agility, being able to move faster. Now, when we look at these two amazing things, there are so many different options of how we can bring them together to deliver value. And when we do that, we, we start with the recognition that not every customer's journey to the cloud is going to be the same. And we need to meet you and give you the tools to move to the cloud when you want to. Again, we recognize the benefits of the cloud, but we also recognize that for many of our largest customers and many of our customers in general, you want to continue to tap into the huge amount of capabilities that we do have through our on-premise DNA center capabilities as well as CLI. So we're gonna continue to invest in making you successful in deploying and managing your networks when you wanna do it on-prem as well as through cloud management. So we really have two ways and choices for you to operate your networks. That's great, but it can be hard then to operate both of these. So we're taking a host of, of actions and how we deliver our products to be able to make sure that no matter which way you choose, if you are moving to the cloud, that we make it as easy as possible for you. So there's three things that we're really doing that I'm gonna highlight here today that are gonna help you on your journey to the cloud, or continuing to manage on-prem. First, we're bringing converged Catalyst infrastructure, both being able to manage it on-prem or in the cloud. I'll talk more about that in a second, but this underpins so much of what we do in our strategy for innovation. Next up, we know that many of you, as I said, will want to continue to manage your devices through CLI on-premise. We're bringing cloud monitoring to you to be able to continue to manage those devices on-premise, but be able to pipe that data now into the Meraki cloud. 
allowing you to move faster, get greater insights, be able to track clients all through that single pane of glass Meraki experience while continuing to manage that device on premise. And finally, for those that want to continue to manage on-prem, that want to deploy DNA Center, I'm really excited that today we're continuing our investments in DNA Center solutions, and we are, really tricky button, now offering you a DNA Center virtual appliance. We are in early field trials for the DNA Center virtual appliance in AWS, giving you more choice in how you deploy DNA Center. You know, this is, this is gonna help you move faster, and a, a prime use case here is, is actually to move off of Prime. If you manage your wireless through Prime, this makes it easier for you to move to a virtual appliance for DNA Center. Now, we're offering that flexibility and choice to DNA customers to be able to do that in AWS, and as I said, early field trials. We're also going to be bringing that in a virtual appliance that you can run in your own data centers. Moving back to cloud here. So we are just extremely thrilled to be able to bring Catalyst to the cloud management experience. And for customers that are ready to take that next step towards cloud management, we're starting, again, with cloud monitoring for Catalyst switching. And what is so exciting about this is it's available today. For fixed port catalyst switching, the 92, the 93, the 9500, you're now able to take that data, continue to manage it on-prem, but pipe that data into Meraki, giving you insights, the ability to you know, see what's going on in your network at a very rapid rate. And you know, our intention, again, is to meet you no matter where you are in this journey, no matter where you're starting from. If, in this case, you, know, you want to continue to manage on-prem, here's how we help you with start to reap some of those benefits of the cloud. And I think this is a huge benefit for those that don't want to adopt necessarily DNA Center but it's even a bigger benefit for those hybrid customers. There's so many hybrid customers that use both DNA Center and Meraki. Cisco does ourselves, right? In our one pen office, you know, it's, it's head to toe Catalyst, and in the Meraki office in San Francisco, Meraki full stack. How can we get better observability of what's going on in that network? Well, we now have the ability to do that. So we're focused on visibility, observability, and insights through cloud monitoring. And we're also looking at how we can help your network operations teams deal with things like compliance, which can be extremely challenging. Now, what is awesome about this and what I think yeah, will resonate with all of you, we're not asking you to buy something new to do this. This is available with your DNA Center license today. You can go uh, and, and, and start getting this working today. Like I said, we're starting with fixed port switching, and over time, we're going to be bringing this to Catalyst Wireless that's managed on-prem, as well as modular switching. Now, beyond monitoring, beyond monitoring, in the journey to full cloud management, I'm extremely proud of what the team has done here, that they now have, in early field trials, the ability to take a Catalyst 9300 and be able to migrate that into the cloud. So no longer managing it on-prem and going into Meraki, migrating that device into the Meraki full management dashboard experience. Our vision here is to do this for the Catalyst 9K line. And again, we're starting with the 9300 in early field trials today. So in your journey to the cloud, you've got you know, monitoring, be able to continue to manage that device on-prem, but being able to pipe the data into the cloud. And then you've got full management of those switches of the 9300s and more to come if you want to go to full management. But I'm also extremely excited to talk about common Wi-Fi 6E. This idea of common catalyst infrastructure. We are launching three new access points today. 
Wi-Fi 6E access points, some of the most powerful access points that'll be available on the market that now give you the choice. Give you the choice to manage that same device either on-prem or into the cloud. This is our first step in, in that you know, unified hardware for wireless, and we're extremely excited to be having these three new access points be available. Two of these access points are ready to order early July, just a couple weeks from now, and they'll be shipping in the late fall. But I do wanna just mention, we will continue to see supply chain challenges in our wireless access points. And if you're in line for that Wi-Fi 6E, you have that order in, I'm gonna encourage you to keep that order there uh, because we do anticipate uh, you know, the same challenges here and you're likely to put yourself further down the line if you move out of the current line you're in. So, so excited about this choice of management through a single hardware. Move to the cloud now, move to the cloud when you're ready. Investment protection for you, our customers. And with that, I wanna show you these. So I wanna invite Joe Aaron out to the stage for some demoing. Thanks, Joe. Chris. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am incredibly excited, and it's great to show it live. It's real. So let's get into it. Absolutely. So you talked a lot about bringing the cloud to these Catalyst platforms, bringing these platforms into the Meraki dashboard, and that's what we actually want to show today. We want to show you what this looks like in the dashboard itself. So what you're seeing here is a network topology for a network that actually includes pretty much all the things that Chris talked about today. It includes the new common hardware access points. It includes some Catalyst 9300s that are actually fully migrated to cloud management. And it includes some 9500 core switches that are managed on-prem, but they're monitored from the cloud. So we're gonna dig in, we're gonna look a little bit what each of these looks like. When we look at the access point, we're gonna see it looks an awful lot like a Meraki access point. Right, and that's what you'd expect. This is now in the full Meraki managed experience, which means it's gonna look, act, and feel exactly like any other Meraki AP. It's gonna give that full cloud management capability, all the same tools, all the same views. If we move up to the 9300 switches, right, that again are fully managed from dashboard, they're gonna look and feel exactly like Meraki MS switches because we're using the same cloud management experience, the same capabilities, we can see here, we've even got a notification that our power supply is offline, which we should probably take a look at after this session. But the beauty of this is, again, that full experience that you get through the cloud delivered on that Cat9K hardware. Now, where, in my humble opinion, this gets even more interesting is when we go up from here into the 9500. And you can see we've got the 9500 uplink here. If I jump over to the 9500, which are, again, not managed from the cloud, but monitored from the cloud, I'm still getting the same look and feel, the same dashboard, the same experience, but I'm getting a subset of those capabilities because, again, this device is not managed from dashboard, it's monitored from dashboard. And so I can see information, as Chris said earlier, right, telemetry and data that's coming from that device flowing into the cloud so that I can see it all here in the dashboard in that single pane of glass. That's awesome. So. Uh... You know, monitoring, it seems powerful, but like what are some of the use cases that you see our customers really being able to solve with monitoring? I think the most obvious one is network health and device health, right? Looking at these switches and seeing if there's something wrong, seeing if they're not operating the way that you want them to, seeing if there are errors on an interface, right? Being able to do some basic troubleshooting. If I wanna go in here and pull up the Mac forwarding table, as an example, right? Having that visibility into whether the device is doing what you need it to do, whether your network is operating the way that you need it to operate. So I think for those of us that got to see Todd Nightingale's keynote, he talked about mismatch VLANs, the scourge of networking. Is that something that we'd be looking at here? It's actually a great example because now that the dashboard is getting data from both the managed and the monitored devices, yeah, we're able to identify things like mismatched VLANs even on devices that aren't being managed from the cloud, which is incredibly powerful. And not only are we able to see the information about the device 
we're also able to see the information about the connected clients, right? What's on the network? What kind of traffic are we passing over the network? Who's doing what, right? What kind of devices, what kind of traffic, what users are connected as well? All that same stuff that's delivered through the dashboard experience. So super powerful for client troubleshooting use cases to be able to see it throughout your entire mixed network here. Okay, but this is in the dashboard. What about those customers that are looking to automate and do more automation through their networks? We have a whole suite, as you know, of APIs that are built into the Meraki dashboard. And we have a lot of customers today who are using those APIs to interact with their Cisco Meraki infrastructure. The beauty of this is when we connect these Catalyst platforms to the cloud, they're also going to be able to leverage those APIs. So you can go and you can hit those APIs and get information out of that centralized cloud dashboard, not only about your Meraki hardware, but about your managed or monitored Catalyst infrastructure as well. So same APIs giving you that insights and information that you want across your estate. That's exactly it. Fantastic. All right, well, Joe, thank you for this. It's live, people. This is great. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate thank you. it. All right. So there is so much more to learn. We are taking our first steps here. I want you all to be able to uh, you know, learn more about these first steps, but we're just in thrilled with all of what we're gonna be able to do here. And I wanna thank you for being on this journey with us as we continue to deliver more innovations in this area, as we bring Catalyst to that cloud-managed experience, but also continue to invest in the tooling that we have to be able to manage your devices on-prem, but also be able to link them up and, and do more with your estates. So to learn more, please go to Grant Shirts product and solutions overview, your network journey, your networking journey your way. You can hear a lot more about how you can get started on your journey to the cloud, if that's your journey today. Stop by the networking demo booths. Uh, we have so much to show you in the Cisco showcase. And then visit the Meraki website to learn more about the benefits of the cloud. And with that, I'm gonna close out. Thank you so much for being with us. Enjoy the rest of Cisco Live. just heard from Chris Story in the Innovation Theater about unified management. Catalyst, Meraki, it used to be an and, or, now it's two great tastes, it tastes great together, and it's the same, is what we're saying now. We can do all that we did before within the DNA spaces, moving those policies back and forth, but you can actually manage and monitor them anywhere. You're on your way to the office to do some monitoring, oh, hit some traffic, oh, I can't get out of the house, oh, I just don't want to spend the gas to get there. I can manage it from anywhere, so you can do it from the cloud. Uh, so if you want to learn more about that, wherever you are on your cloud management journey, there's more that you can find in uh, the networking space and the networking showcases that we have down here over at the Network Operations Center next to us at the broadcast studio. I'm Annie Murphy. I'm here in studio, actually on the World of Solutions to show floor live from Cisco Live, Las Vegas 2022, where in day two, we're underway. We've got all of this traffic here, but you can also check us out online at CiscoLive.com, as well as you can participate with hashtag CiscoLive on Twitter and on your Instagram. We'd love to see your faces. You can also tag us at CiscoLive. Uh, in a little bit, we're going to hear from Rob Boyd. He's supposed to be on the floor somewhere. And I think that uh, we're going to take a look at what we're doing at the WebEx Innovations and Integrations Corner at the far end. If you're here on site, you can join us. You can take a look at what we're doing down there. Rob, show us what we've got going on over there in the corner. I hear you're going uh, into deep space. Well, potentially going into deep space. I think the launch has been delayed till August or sometime in the fall time frame. But yes, that's exactly what they're talking about here. But this work has been going on well without me and for quite some time. And Annie, it was your recommendation that I should come and check this place out. I'm so glad you, you brought it to my attention. But guys, if, you, if you're on the show floor and you have a chance, either way, you can get this information digitally as well. But if you're here, 
we've got a full kind of space shuttle replica here, and what they're showing in the technology is, is the different work that uh, Cisco's been doing in collaboration with Amazon and Lockheed Martin. And the idea is that we don't know how some of the tools that maybe we tend to rely on or use here are going to work in deep space on a regular basis. It's a completely different environment for obvious reasons. I don't think in the deep vacuum of space that the noise suppression on WebEx is suddenly going to add noise back in, maybe, since there's no noise. I don't know. Who knows? Thoughts to dwell on, Isaac Asimov material perhaps. But what's interesting here is that they are working with the NASA Space Network to say, with all the incredible delay, with all the ways in which information is, is potentially going to go back and forth, how can you really get something like rich media uh, in a collaborative fashion that's something you're used to and they're experimenting with new codecs and being able to do things that I wouldn't even have thought possible. I want to introduce uh, Jono Luck. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, I'll make is. sure I say it right. Thank you. But uh, tell us what you're responsible for and what's most important about someone that might uh, take away from what you guys have set up here. Sure, so I'm the sponsor from the business unit uh, for all the work that we're doing with uh, Lockheed Martin and Amazon. Actually, we were there in a very dark room in Houston dreaming up what might be possible. And so it's really cool to see, while not the real thing, at least a good proximity of what we're actually going to do. Um, you said most of the things I think people should take away from this, right? Well, uh, you study. did all your homework, okay. you remembered it. Thank you. Um, I mean, the, the big problem we have to solve is as these these missions go further and further out. This isn't just a trip around the Earth. This is the moon, this is Mars. There's a lot of problems that we have to solve. You mentioned the codex, compression, the latency. It takes a long time for signals to get. That's hard work that we had to figure out and we're super proud that we, with the WebEx team, were able to do that. Um, the other thing I'm going to mention too is think about this. As we do more space exploration, you can't fly 30, 50, 70 scientists. So the video that we think of to get work done here on Earth is going to help scientists on Earth track those experiments in space. Now everyone can be looking over the shoulder, so to speak, as those experiments are happening. And that's where, that's thanks to the WebEx boards that we have, that video collaboration, as you mentioned. Um, I, I think that's really exciting, right? We can revolutionize space exploration. Well, I love the, the partnership also with Amazon, kind of figuring out what is the right interface that we are gonna quickly grok to. We've got, uh, you know, potentially space travel continuing to kind of expand. I think we have this issue, we always think about onboarding in our, in our business, but onboarding yourself into space and using tools that are much more complex or different. Yes, the astronauts are trained, but how quickly could they begin to do things that shouldn't be difficult? We can simplify that interface. Alexa, even when not connected to the cloud below, has to be able to understand maybe a completely different set of instructions here. Is that kind of the realm in which we're doing the partnership with Amazon there? It absolutely is. I mean, something we take for granted, like asking Alexa a question, what's the temperature outside? What's traffic like? Like you said, can revolutionize how those astronauts get work done. The screens they have to deal with have hundreds of data points. And so with Alexa, asking a question of what is their rotational velocity, what is the temperature, makes it fast, easy, and hands-free. And so there's absolutely, to your point, you know, a, a, an efficiency gain that makes space exploration just so much easier. That is awesome. Thank you so much. I was actually absolutely. testing out that uh, Alexa connection. I said, turn on my kitchen lights. My kids confirmed they came on back in Dallas. Yep. So the connectivity is incredible. Ask her to play music. That's that was perfect. Point. Well, guys, thank you so much. Thank guys, I'm just going to give you a brief look before we run out of time. There's a lot of interesting people to talk here as there are all over the show floor. One of the things I found interesting that I didn't get to do because I did not make time with a reservation but let me show you the hologram over here as best we can. Follow me, I'm trying not to turn my back to you guys. Excuse me, we're gonna come through here real quick. So they're doing some interesting stuff with Vidcast, but then it's a partnership also with WebEx Leap and what we're doing in terms of the hologram over here, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about. Sorry. But if you come around here, there's people that are in here experiencing essentially where things are going from a hologram perspective. I'll have Julie come around and look at this on screen to give you an idea since we can't and don't want to interrupt their meetings. But essentially, this is where some of our collaboration is now going. It's not out yet, but the testing is going on. You can come to the booth, you can experience what it would be like to interact in a holographic fashion with more senses engaged, really making kind of a different remote, but maybe much more personal connection when you start looking at what the, where these things are going here. And to be fair, WebEx is not getting into the you know, glasses business. We're try, not trying to make headsets or anything like that. It's really about a platform. And I think that's the right place to be. And it's really about what's that next level of communication, be it in space, with how do we collaborate there and interface correctly, to how do we do it with people here on Earth. We got lots of options and WebEx is leading the way. So with that, I'll hand it back over to you, Annie. 
That's awesome, Rob. Are you actually talking to me or are you actually back at home and I'm just speaking to a hologram version of Rob brought to me by WebEx? Don't, don't even bring that up. You know, I found out from the <laughs> talking to the Lockheed Martin guys over here, I think the stat they dropped on me was, you know, when you talk about how fast you can onboard and get people working correctly, these astronauts make like, they, it's like 250,000 an hour. And so I've made a little mental note to talk to the producers here because my day rate is way off. If that's the going rate <laughs> that we should be targeting. Well, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible if you think about it. All the innovations that we're doing within WebEx and that partnership. If you're here on the show floor, take a look down there at the WebEx Integrations and Innovation Center. Earlier, we were able to have a really close look at the Cisco Showcase. Uh, you might see a few familiar faces. We are going to walk you through all of the innovations that Cisco has been able to do since it's been a while since the last time we were able to be at Cisco Live. Live. We're going to take a look at the Showcase Theater. We're going to have uh, some walkthroughs and some demonstrations. Why don't you take a look at this tour? Welcome to Cisco Live 2022. That's right, we're here physically in person in Las Vegas, but we have not backed off on the full digital experience, so no matter how you're enjoying this, we want to make sure you get everything you need to be effective. I'm in front of the Cisco Showcase, where there is all kinds of great people that are sharing how we can work in a more optimal fashion, work from anywhere, from home, from the office, wherever you need to do to get stuff done. Earlier today, we had a chance to talk with some of the experts to figure out what all it takes in all these different situations to pull off that, mm, that perfect experience. So I want to share that with you and we'll start with Lauren White in Work From Office. I am excited to be here with distinguished architect, Vanessa. Vanessa, where are we? Lauren, we're actually standing in the Work From Office environment and we also have Work From Home and Work From Anywhere. And these three immersive, interactive environments have been set up to showcase how Cisco can make hybrid work better. So whether you're working from home, whether you're in the office, running a global meeting or event, or you're out and about trying to be productive on the go, WebEx powers your hybrid work. So I'd love to show you how we're now hybrid working at Cisco. Let's go. Lauren, welcome to our newly transformed New York City office, Pen One. Now this is Cisco's first fully PoE powered, smart building enabled office. And it's designed to create an environment that will attract and retain our top talent, will maintain their well-being, and give them the ultimate flexible working. I'm super impressed. Can you share more about the technologies that are powering this reimagined workplace, you know, making things more flexible, more sustainable, more visible? Yeah, oh, we've got so many great Cisco technologies here. We've got the Catalyst 9000 switches. We've got Wi-Fi 6E. We've got the Meraki MV cameras, the WebEx devices and the room navigators. We've got PoE and PoE lighting sensors, even PoE powered desks, the WebEx desk hub and the cameras and headsets. And it's all managed by DNA Center, ISE, DNA Spaces and the brand new Cisco Smart Workspaces. I have to know more about Smart Workspaces. Can you tell me more? Oh, I can show you. So this is Cisco Smart Workspaces and this is from our DNA Spaces platform and it integrates our Cisco wired and wireless infrastructure, our Meraki MV cameras and our WebEx devices and creates a real-time visibility dashboard that shows occupancy status, shows uh, temperature, humidity, air quality, space availability for our meeting rooms and our desks and so much more. So the, the first thing I'm thinking, Vanessa, is what organizations could benefit most from something like this? Do you know, every organization with a corporate office can really benefit from the visibility it provides. Their people are looking for information and guidance and so they'll really welcome the current office status. But their facilities, management and leadership really would love workplace insights in the new workplace cadence as well as workspace usage. And I know that's something every organization is looking for. Amazing, thank you so much, Vanessa. Now over to Alex.
at the IT Operations Center. Hey, thanks, Lauren, and thank you, Vanessa, for walking us through all those different hybrid work experiences. Now, I'm standing here in the IT Operations Center, which runs right down the center of the Cisco Showcase. And if there was a curtain here, I'd be pulling it back because we're going to be taking a look at all those different Cisco solutions that enable all those hybrid work experiences that Vanessa just shared with us. So I'm standing here with Grant Shirk. He's our head of product marketing at Cisco Meraki. Grant, what can audiences expect to discover here at the IT Operations Center? Thanks, Alex. It's great to be here. Uh, there are over 20 different demos of those platforms that make hybrid work. Everything from full stack observability from the teams at Thousand Eyes and App Dynamics to make sure that absolutely every application you run is as optimized and running at its best. Uh, then you can step back into the world of security and look at both our Cisco Talos, the power of that research organization, as well as the brand new Cisco Plus Secure Connect Now turnkey SASE solution that was just launched last week. Uh, but the one that's near and dear to my heart is the cloud management capabilities that we are demoing here, whether it is the core Meraki or the brand new cloud management for Catalyst that we're announcing in the keynote. Oh, awesome. And I'm very much a visual learner. Can you demo that for me on the screen here? Yeah, absolutely. So what you see right here is the Meraki dashboard. And if you haven't seen it lately, it's got a fresh new look. And this is the next generation Meraki dashboard, and we purpose built it for the scale of some of our customers who are running Catalyst at the core. Uh, what you're seeing here is the switch view. Uh, and what is new about this is, unlike the past, where it was only Meraki gear visible in this, uh, you actually have the ability to see those Catalyst 9500s, 9300s that are at the heart of your network. And whether your switch is 1,000 feet away, one of the ones running the showcase here, or 1,000 miles away, this one happens to be in San Jose at the, at the Tasman campus. Yeah. I have the ability to monitor, inspect, and even do some basic troubleshooting on my infrastructure. It's an incredibly powerful way for people to scale up and adjust their networks. Awesome, thanks Grant for walking us through this. Now up next is the Network Operations Center, also known as the NOC, which is essentially the heartbeat of Cisco Live. So let's now go find out exactly what does it take to deploy, monitor, and secure this live Cisco Live network. Hey Rob, knock, knock, knock. Are you there? Who, who's there? Oh, it's Alex with a knock, knock, knock joke. Get it? Who's in the... All right, JW's here. We're in the NOC. I'm so happy to have you here, JW, especially physically again. Tell me a little bit about what we have here. Is this real, first of all? Are these just screens to give us some action, or is this what's actually happening on the show floor? Yeah, no, great, thanks. It's awesome to be back in Vegas. It's been three years since we've done a Cisco Live, so we're super excited to be here. And you're right, a lot of people do think that this is just static equipment on display, but actually at Cisco Live, our network is a live demo. So this is all actually running the network here at Cisco Live. These are live stats. You can see over here on the wireless count, overnight it was a big dip, now we dropped, popped up, we've got almost 10,000 people on this morning and the show floor doesn't even open for an hour, so. Yeah, I love how the graphics can kind of indicate, okay, people are starting to arrive, whether we see them or not, the data says exactly what's happening as people start to connect. Well, let me ask you, for anyone that doesn't understand just how seriously you and your team take this endeavor, what all does the knock encompass in terms of, what are you responsible for, I guess is one way to put it. Sure, yeah, that's all the network for the event, really. I mean, we're, we have all the Mandalay Bay property, just not the exhibit hall and the meeting areas, but we have the breakout rooms upstairs, we have the technical seminars. We have across the street at the Luxor, we have a direct fiber link over there where we have a distribution, we're supporting testing center and some labs. And then we have fiber to the Four Seasons Conference Center as well where we have a press and analyst. Gotcha, so just the last question, I know you guys are constantly kind of upping your game and trying to get better each time as you tweak and the services that you provide for everybody here, including all the vendors, because it's very involved. You get here early, what, what kind of stuff are you doing different now that you think is worth mentioning you know, as you've improved for 2022? No, yeah, that's great. We, and uh, we do get here early, we have a really big team. We get support from all across Cisco, from CX, from the BUs, from sales. And then we also have some partners that support us. And we have NetApp in here, We've got Veeam helping us with our backup solution, and Legrand providing uh, this great look for our racks and, and all the fiber. But what we're doing new this year is Lumen has partnered with us to bring in three by 100 gig links. So we actually have a theoretical 320 gig symmetrical uh, out from the venue. Wow, yeah, that's interesting. I, think we for I forget, because there's so many different things that go on, is that the event is actually a lot of different events that are happening. You're connecting hotels, you're connecting things that happen at different time frames, from education to certainly all the video streaming that we're doing as well. Well, JW, your team has done 
good. I mean, we're all online. I've heard zero complaints, nothing but good stuff. So thank you so much. Is there any final point you want to make? You know, I'm just glad to be yeah. here, buddy. Okay. I was making sure I didn't miss something. I thought you were ready to say it. Thank you so much. It's always good to see you. Yeah. But guys, come check out The Knock if you're physically here. If not, there are all kinds of resources online. But with that, let's check back in with Lauren, shall we? Thank you, Rob. I am standing here with product marketing manager, Lisa Waddell. How are you? Can you tell us about how the service provider products hardware and optics work together to make hybrid work work better? Sure. So the service providers are an essential part of the hybrid work ecosystem. They create the network that connects your working from home, working from your car, working from the coffee shop. They build that whole network. Can you tell us about the innovations and service provider Wonderwall? So what we have here at the SP Wonderwall is the Cisco blueprint for service providers. We have a full production environment that Cisco builds. So I want to tell you a minute about why this matters. Cisco's purpose is to build an inclusive future for all. And so what we're doing is changing the economics of the internet to close the digital divide between those that have high-speed internet and those that don't. And we're also helping create networks that are more affordable, better managed, and lower optics. And the question is, how do we do that? We combine the power of optics, silicon, software, and systems. Together, these components are converging different layers to make a fully automated network. We're converging as much as possible in the transport layer, in the automation layer, in the subscriber management layer. And this is changing the economics from a capital perspective to an operational perspective. And we are seeing great results. So some of our new solutions like routed optical networking are bringing our customers lower TCO by as much as 46%. And when they, those that have been in this transformational journey have been better able to respond to the pandemic and the hybrid work models that have come out and all of the connectivity that's needed. So I want to talk a little bit about the Wonderwall here. So we have a full production environment from excess, pre-aggregation, aggregation, core, and um, we have along each area the components that you need, the optics and the appliances that you need. I really want to tell you about Cisco Silicon One. It's our unified network processor architecture that we built in-house and it's used in all of our devices. We also have optical optics devices that you can see here at the Wonderwall. We've also integrated all the pieces of cloud and data centers that service providers need because they are now providing 5G and value-added services like the Internet of Things. Of course, we provide automation and security across the entire production environment and finally, what's important is that we are helping with segment routing so that um, the service providers can do network slicing, which means they can add value-added services like SD-WAN and private 5G. So this is the full live environment. We also have a digital environment where you can go through everything we've talked about and get details. Wow. Well Thank you so much for that, Lisa. Now we are going to check in with Alex over at the hybrid cloud area. Thanks, Lauren. And one of the things we're most excited about here at Cisco Live is the launch of our Cisco Nexus 9808 switch. It's located over here in the hybrid cloud area. And I'm standing here next to Gerald Richard, who is our product manager of the Nexus portfolio. Gerald, who exactly is this switch for? Hi, thank you. Um, so this is the Nexus 9800. So this switch is designed and positioned for all our current customers, um, especially large enterprises, large financial customers, or cloud service providers, and any kind of data center operators. Uh, so along with the chassis, we are also introducing a new 400 gig line card. It's a 36 port 400 gig line card that pretty much doubles the port density and capacity compared to the Nexus 9500. So all the ports are QSOP DD based, so which means you do get backwards compatibility with 100 gig and 40 gig uh, for QSOP Plus and QSOP 28. Um, in addition to the line cards, being a modular chassis, we have dual supervisors that offer supervisor redundancy. 
And then to power the chassis, to provide capacity, we have fabric modules at the back, up to eight fabric modules that give almost 14.4 terabits per slot. Um, in addition to that, from a functional standpoint, the line cards support MACSAC, so you can get line rate MACSAC across all ports at all speeds as well. And similar to the rest of the Nexus 9000 portfolio, the 9800 also supports ACI and NXOS. Awesome, I mean this sounds like a very powerful machine. It is. But how well would you say it would fare underwater? Not good at all. Not good, that's Not what good. I thought. Well you might be surprised by this next device. Lauren is standing by the IoT wall. Lauren, what you got for us over there? Now, I am here with Matt Bolick, Director of Technical Marketing Engineering at Cisco. And Matt, I gotta understand what's going on here. My eight and a half years at Cisco, I have never seen an access point in water. And I don't think Cisco's in the fish business, right? Well, you so know, you know Lauren, what? all of the customers and all of the aquariums that are out there that need to provide connectivity to their aquariums, we got you covered. <laughs> For everybody else, this is just an example of the ruggedness that's built into our access points, into a lot of our IoT, into a lot of our industrial products. So this specifically is the new Catalyst IW9167E access point. It's a mouthful, but the main thing to take away from that is that this is our first outdoor rugged Wi-Fi 6E access point. It's really cool because that means it can take advantage of all the additional capabilities in 6E. It can move up to the 6 gigahertz spectrums as the different regulatory bodies turn that on and everything works great with that. So it's a really pretty awesome access point. You'll, you'll start seeing it outdoors in lots of places that need connectivity outdoors. This is just an example of how it can take dust, heat, humidity, rain, storms, hail, whatever you want to throw at it, this can take it. Thank you, Matt. Now over to Rob from the fishbowl to the bakery. All right, Lauren, thank you so much. I'm over here in a different part of the Cisco Showcase, and whenever I'm lost, I always try to find Scott Newman because he always helps me dig out of the uh, wherever I happen to be. So, Scott, thank you so much for always uh, being there to help me. Where are we, and, and, and what is this space? Are we at the beginning, or are we at the end of this journey? Right. We're at the beginning, Rob. And we are here in our Work Anywhere environment. In this case, it's a bakery here at Cisco Live. And in this bakery, you'll find the latest and greatest solutions for hybrid work, stuff from WebEx, our software solutions from WebEx. We've got our Meraki Wi-Fi 6E for that great connectivity in public spaces. And of course, we're securing it all with Cisco security solutions. But no matter what industry you're from, no matter where work from is for you, whether it's an open pit mine, an airport, your mother-in-law's house, or here in our bakery, yep. Cisco has the solutions that enable you to work productively, collaboratively, and of course, securely from anywhere. Well, that's awesome. I appreciate all the hard work you guys have put into making this feel like home, no matter where home might be. Uh, but let me, if you can't be physically here, how do we get to more resources? What's available even after the show, perhaps? Great, so visit our digital showcase, okay. which is at ciscolive.com, and it's running through the end of June. And there you can find all of these hybrid work solutions that we've been talking about and showing you today. And of course, our on-demand library is always available 24 seven at ciscolive.com. That's perfect, so a lot of good stuff. Scott, thank you so much, appreciate your time. Guys, obviously here, if you get a chance to make it to the Cisco Showcase, there's all kinds of great information to be put in the form in which you can readily understand it and go to as far down as you want to go. But the point is that there are a lot of resources available for connected learning. Go online, access your resources, access live resources, curated videos, all kinds of great stuff to learn as we move forward. There's no excuse for not being aware this team has been working extremely hard. My name is Rob Boyd, thanks for joining us in the Cisco Showcase. We'll see you on the next one. look at the Cisco Showcase Tour. Uh, in a little bit later on, we're going to have uh, Chris Story and Javad Khan talk about hybrid work and the innovation theater. Uh, coming up next, we've also got a couple of sneak peeks of other pieces that we're doing around hybrid work in general. For us at Cisco, this is a common way of life. We've been doing this for quite a few years now, and now it's gone global. We're seeing it all over the place. It's not just with ourselves, but also with our customers and partners. And what I found, for me anyways, it's made my life so much easier to be able to talk to people in a way that we've gotten to the place where if I want, we're not in the same time zone, maybe I'm trying to reach a particular piece of talent or a resource, 
that before wasn't necessarily as accessible, but now it doesn't really matter because everybody is so used to it from teachers to doctors to students, uh, everywhere you want to go, you can still be able to connect from anywhere to anyone at any time, really, is what it's been coming to. And so we're going to hear a little bit more and we're going to deep dive into hybrid work solutions, how to be successful both for people who are working from home, but also how do we support that kind of a space. Um, we're going to actually, we just took a look at the Cisco Showcase, but we're going to go back into the Cisco Showcase with uh, my friend Alex Felker. He's going to take a closer look at some places that he wanted to take a better look at while we were on the show floor today. Alex, where are you? Hey, Annie. Yes, I'm over here in the hybrid work experience section, and I want to show you exactly what it looks like when I work full-time remote, because I am full-time remote from actually from Denver, Colorado. So I'm very much used to the space. So come over here to my home office. Well, it looks similar to this, maybe not as clean and, and white everywhere, probably a lot more food, and oh, there's my coffee, perfect. That is, actually is pretty normal. So as you can see with my home setup, I usually have my laptop plugged into my desk pro, giving me that very much that rich sound, that in-person experience that I have with people who are dialing in from other telepresence units and things like that. As you can see, it has great HD quality. Let's go ahead and see it. Whoa, hey, hey team, how's it going? As you can see, perfect. Yeah, we love this experience with the Desk Pro connected to everything. It powers my machine. This is probably not my decor choice, but I would typically have my dog, Ringo, here next to me. Hey, even comes with a WebEx collar. Nice to be on brand, Ringo. Appreciate that. Who put a metal ball in there? That's probably not good for the dog's teeth. But sometimes when I'm working from home, you know, my toddler gets sick. He needs to stay home with me. I can't always work in my home office. So there are sometimes times when I need to be able to have that immersive experience in a portable way. That's why we have this Desk Mini, which is actually probably half the cost of that Desk Pro. And if I had this, I could not just be dependent on my laptop as I move to the bedroom, to the kitchen. I could actually have that same rich experience, put the computer right in front, have that dual monitor, and then if I need to move room to room with my son, I can just pick it up and take it with me. And then after the call, I have that great speaker just to rock out to some music. I could probably hold a cup of coffee at the same time while I, while I carry this thing. Oh. <laughs> just kidding, it's, it's fake. It's fake here. The machine is real, but the coffee, that's fake. So now as we walk over here, let's say I need to go into the office now and I'm moving from my home. I drove over to, let's say the, the Denver office. I want to make sure, hey, how, what's the floor looking at? What's the capacity? How many people are actually in here that are going to be joining me today? Well, I can take a look at the monitor that might be displayed right when I get out the elevator door. There's going to be a monitor that shows me exactly how many people are here. All the red dots that you see right here are occupied rooms. All the green ones are ones that are available that I could go dial into, have a chat, uh, take my meeting from there. And I have this great, this great insight into like, what's the temperature like? What's the air quality like? Is it good? What's the density of people that are in all these different rooms? If I join a call with a couple colleagues in a, with one, within one of these conference rooms, the temperature will automatically adjust because it knows that we have much more body heat within that room. So awesome information that's coming to us from the Cisco DNA sessions. So. With that, I think this is a good overview from going from the home to the office. Annie, what did you think of that? Going back to you. Uh, that was pretty awesome, Alex. Um, I'm, I'm kind of here in studio, so I haven't had a chance to go over there and check that out yet. If you guys are here in Las Vegas, go check out the home office hybrid work setup over on the Cisco Showcase floor. Earlier today, we had the first keynote of the event on day two at the top of the uh, at the top of the day. Alex, I know you were taking some good notes. Uh, for me, I think what really stood out was just this idea of complete flexibility, cloud, being able to kind of like pretty much connect from anywhere to anyone, any place, any time. Uh, what were some of your key thoughts or your thoughts on the keynote this morning? Can Alex still hear me? Oh, I can't, I guess you can't hear it, so we can't hear Alex. Uh, well, for me, what I thought was really interesting is, is that we talked about, and Todd really kind of brought this out as well, when we're thinking about being able to go from a catalyst 
to a Meraki, doesn't matter if it's a switch or an access point. We've got these dual personas, not just in the switches, but in the APs as well, which is pretty cool in terms of access. And you think about how many endpoints, the diversity of endpoints, as well as being able to manage, as well as the uh, monitoring piece, it doesn't really matter. I know that you have folks that maybe it's a different group that's looking at the monitoring piece, you have a different group that's looking at the management piece, and they may be having to switch between different uh, interfaces when they're doing this, and it doesn't matter if they can connect uh, in the operation center or from home, and they'd be able to actually have the same experience regardless, and have that same rich uh, insight, data, telemetry from all of those endpoints as they come into the switch regardless of platform, and what they can come to know and love from Cisco, and in a changing environment, why it's so important. Um, Earlier today, or earlier this week, we did have a chance to kind of walk the floor. Uh, we got to meet some of the new folks, and I believe that Rob Boyd is in the new corner. Uh, he was at WebEx earlier, and I think now he's over in the DevNet zone. Rob, what do you? It looks like a robot that you're next to over there. Yeah, there's an honest to god robot here, and. Um, so here's the interesting thing about DevNet. For anyone that is worried or shares some of the concerns that, that I have that sometimes these things are faked or anything else, DevNet is almost always the real deal. And there's a couple of reasons why I always love the DevNet area. And it's not that my first introduction to DevNet was had a lot of really good imported beers. It's really about the fact that these guys are focused on learning and interaction. And that when you come to DevNet, even though it's almost a show within a show, because there's so much education, there's so many things to learn, but ultimately it's about everything else that is here. Now what we're happening, what's happening with the robot, or what I mean by everything else that's here is the fact that you're interacting with multiple Cisco technology areas, but we're doing it through the ways in which our customers are going to be doing it as they move towards automation and programmability, is they're doing it with APIs. And specifically the robot area here is uh, uh, they are doing a competition where they have to use REST API calls to control the robot, move these common sports objects, these sports balls, uh, over, drop it in, and then potentially score points by dropping on this makeshift budget pachinko board. Okay, so he's going to drop the tennis ball. Look at that, look at that. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, hey, I played with balls and stuff like this when I was a child, so what's the big deal? The big deal is just about the interaction. But if you're really good at REST APIs, they're going to take you up. They're going to say, hey, you know what? We're going to do net conf and some REST conf. Okay, and we'll see how well you do there. So there's a lot of stuff to do here, but it's about kind of showcasing skills and learning at the same time as you compete because they give away prizes all day long. Uh, and we'll probably at the end of the day, I probably shouldn't overpromise what they have going on here. But let's take a look at, okay, we're gonna get the action shot of the, come on, don't let us down, get the ball over here. All right, and let's see as it goes down, we got a bump, we got a, oh, oh, I'm sorry, you won absolutely nothing with that particular one, but you got 75 for the tennis ball, so we'll take that. Now another interesting area where they're also doing the contest that I'll point out, is we got these race cars here. And the idea here is that they're going to ask you some devneck oriented questions on the computers. I'll let Julie go over and get a close look. Your car only advances forward when you answer the question correctly. And then they track this so they can have a leaderboard going throughout the day. But as long as you know it, you can come over here, race, prove your skill levels. But either way, when you come to DevNet, come to learn, come to sit down, pay attention, and soak up the resources. But with that, I'll have Julie come back toward me. So she's all fascinated with the cars. Julie, if you can hear me, I'm going to throw it back over to Annie, regardless of what Julie's doing. We're having fun over in DevNet. We're learning, and we're having uh, fun doing it. So, Annie? Oh, that's awesome, Rob. Also, just for the folks that are watching this broadcast from home, you can participate in the DevNet Dash as well. We have a virtual version of the DevNet Dash where you can go ahead and test your knowledge of DevNet and see that you can compete against other folks to see how you do on the virtual leaderboard. If you are here uh, at, at Cisco Live on site, next to the DevNet Dash, I want you to take a look at the most fastest autonomous car uh, in the world going, topping out at 192.2 miles per hour, also brought to you with the power of DevNet. Uh, we are basically uh, just a few minutes away from going into the innovation theater with Chris Story and Javed Khan to talk about hybrid work. Uh, we are a couple of different housekeeping items. Just remember just to tweet us, hashtag Cisco Live if you're here on the floor. Earlier, I was trying to get into the showcase to talk to Alex about his thoughts on the keynote. Alex, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, got we got, we've got Alex back. Hey, Alex, how's it going? Andy, it's going pretty good. How are you doing in the studio there? 
<laughs> I'm doing pretty good. We're, we're definitely underway halfway through the event. Perfect. Well, I'm just around the corner from where I left you over at the Cisco DNA Spaces. I'm here at the Cisco on Cisco booth, also known as Cisco IT. Uh, I'm very familiar with this space because this is actually the team that I spent a decade with uh, of my time here at Cisco. And so Cisco on Cisco is all about telling our story. It's all about showing how we use our own technology and products and services within Cisco itself. So come over here, check out some demos, including like the WebEx Hub and Cisco DNA Spaces. What's also special about Cisco IT is they have their own program here at Cisco Live called the IT Leadership Program. And I have Esteban Frias here, who's gonna tell us a little bit about the IT Leadership Program and who it exactly is for, Esteban. Sure, Cisco uh, IT leadership is for any uh, leader in uh, IT. It could be at all levels of it. It could be an uh, individual contributor or a director. If you have a passion to learn, IT leadership is for you. We talk about technology, we talk about social impact, we talk about just leadership in general. So if you want to learn from your peers and you want to learn uh, how we do things uh, and how we partner with uh, other, other of our peers as well, this is the place for you to be. Awesome, thank you very much, Annie, and back to you. So we just got about a minute left as we go into the Innovation Theater with Chris Story and Javad Khan to talk about thriving in a hybrid workspace. We just heard from Alex on the showcase floor, also in the hybrid workspace. If you're here, go and check it out. And I think we're about to go into the theater. Yes, we're very close. And we are going to look at, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Earlier today, we had heard a little bit from Chris Story in the Innovation Theater about how to manage all of those kind of infrastructures and spaces. We're now going to go into the experience themselves for the workers. I believe we're almost ready. I'm just making sure that we have, I'm not seeing anything on my monitor down here, so I just want to make sure that we're almost ready for the setup to see Javed Khan joining the stage, and I believe we are ready. So here we go to the Innovation Theater. Welcome everyone, and, and thank you so much for joining. It is so cool to be back live on stage, presenting in person. Chris and I have some amazing stuff to show you, including lots of demos on our new hybrid work solutions. It's gonna be fun. Now this event itself is an hybrid event. Thanks to all of you joining remotely. And yes, we're gonna be using Slido, which is now a part of the WebEx suite, so all of you can participate. Pull out your cell phones, you can scan that uh, QR code, and we've got a couple of questions that we've uh, asked in Slido, and we will uh, share the results uh, along the way. Now we all remember March 2020, working from the office became working from home in an instant. And more recently, offices have started to open up, and we've tried to pivot back to seeing our colleagues in person. But you know what? The world has changed forever. How we work has changed forever. Hybrid is the new normal, it's not going back. But we must also acknowledge that hybrid work is different and harder than the way we worked before. Now we know that because we are starting to see new challenges emerge as you go from mostly remote employees to a mix of remote and in-person employees. So your meetings now start to look something like this. The five people in the conference room, if you're remote, can't really tell if they're paying attention. And what happens when two of them stand up and start to whiteboard? If you're remote, you get left out. And as people start to get back in the office, they're gonna expect better experiences than they had at home. Otherwise, guess what? They're not coming back. And remember, video usage was minimal before 2019. What happens when you have 100 employees on campus all on video? Is your network ready? And then you've gone from managing 50 to 60 offices to 50, 60,000 remote offices, all connecting to a third party cloud. How do you manage and secure your hybrid work experiences? Seamless and secure experiences in this new world are going to require new solutions. Your collaboration software, your hardware, your devices, your network need to work seamlessly together. So for the rest of the show, Chris and I are going to show you how Cisco is solving for this new environment. I'm going to show you how we've completely reimagined workspaces. Then I'm going to show you how the WebEx suite is solving for flexible work styles. 
And finally, Chris is going to show you how powerful security and manageability enables these great hybrid work experiences. So let's get started with hybrid workspaces. Now, I did, we did have a question here that we asked in Slido. Where do you most uh, do most of your work from? So let's take a look at uh, the results of the Slido poll. Thank you for participating. Look at that. So many responses in such a short time. And uh, some interesting answers there. And yep, we've joined meetings from all of those workspaces that we just talked about. That is why at Cisco, we've spent a lot of time over the last 12 months reimagining these workspaces, whether that's the home, the office, or somewhere in between. So I'm going to show you some of those innovations. First, I'm going to start with working in a shared space, which became the normal in the last couple of years. And that could be your kitchen table, some place at home, or maybe a shared space in the office. We need the right set of tools to be productive in these busy and often very noisy spaces. And we've made phenomenal progress with our new WebEx app. If you haven't tried the new WebEx app, you should. It's just amazing. But the thing I'm most proud about is the improvements we've made to our audio technology. And I'm going to show you some of that. So we are, here we are in the WebEx app, and we've got Anne-Marie joining all the way from Oslo. Say hi to Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie, uh, hi from Vegas. How are you? Hey, it's good. Thanks, thanks Javed. And nice to see you guys. It's really great. Uh, to be back in the office here in uh, Oslo, uh, of course. I kind of wish that I was... I'm having trouble hearing you. Okay, um, let me just go ahead and fix that for you two seconds. So, yeah, it's been really good to be back in the office. I, of course, wish, wish that I was in Vegas with you guys, but hopefully next time. Enjoy Cisco Live. As you can see, amazing noise reduction now in the WebEx app, but also in all of our devices. Now, the same technology, by the way, also allows you to focus either on a single speaker or optimize for all voices while removing background noise. Really useful in those shared workspaces. It's now available in the app and in our video devices. Now, another problem you run into normally is you're in this meeting and you're now ready to head into the office. Or maybe you need to jump in your car to pick up your kids. So what happens? Here's what happens. You pull out your phone. You try to join the same meeting. You end up in that meeting twice. You get that dreaded echo loop. And suddenly, you've interrupted the entire meeting. So we've solved for that. We've solved with a new experience that we've added to our app. And all you have to do is pull out your phone and go ahead and scan my, as soon as, there we go. Scan the QR code. What happens is we hang up the meeting on your laptop. The meeting transfers to my phone. And Marie, I'm going to head into my car. I'm going to see you soon. So no more echo loop. The meeting transfers. And by the way, just yesterday, we announced yet another improvement, CarPlay, CarPlay support for WebEx. Hear more about it in G2's keynote tomorrow. Or, if you're in a hurry, go down to the show floor, and you'll see a demo of that. So for employees headed into the office, the expectations are going to be different. They're going to expect better experiences than they're used to. And that means our office layout needs to change. You're going to need a lot more shared spaces and open spaces. So let's head into the office. You head into the office, and one of the problems nowadays is I need to find a space to work with. With DNA spaces, we are solving for that. So I'm going to bring up DNA spaces. And this is a live view of our New York City office at Penn One Plaza, the ninth floor. This is a live view. And you can see, I can now see, oh, look, these are the offices that are occupied. There are some open spaces that are available. And I'm new to the office, so I can actually navigate my way around because there's a 3D map. Or I could pick one of these spaces available right now and put that on hold. So with DNA spaces, I can reserve a space. Now, there's a lot more functionality in here. When Chris comes on stage later, he's going to show you some of that. Next over, let's head to that shared workspace. Now, your shared workspace needs to be more than a place where you just plug in your laptop. It actually needs to be personalized for you. So we're going to show you how that experience works. So imagine this is a shared workspace. And the same experience we've implemented into our WebEx Desk Mini and our Desk Hub. All you have to do is, again, show up, scan that QR code, 
for that shared workspace. And it's going to ask you if you want to reserve that space. So I'm going to reserve that space for a few hours. And this becomes my shared workspace, my personalized workspace now. In addition, what it's done is pulled down the, my meetings from the calendar. And you can see there's a WebEx meeting on my calendar. There's a Teams meeting. Uh, and we've also added support for uh, Google and Microsoft. So I can now join my meetings from this shared space. I don't have to worry about what my next meeting is. So that's shared workspaces. The other space we are, uh, we are seeing, you're going to see emerge is the ideation space, place where you can uh, whiteboard and co-create content with your co colleagues. So I'm going to show you that experience, and I'm going to head back over here and uh, call back into a WebEx meeting. So this is our WebEx uh, uh, board, which is ideal for open spaces uh, where you can um, uh, co-create content with your colleagues. I'm going to join a WebEx meeting, and I've got a couple of my colleagues uh, waiting for me there. And this is the typical view you normally see uh, on our devices. And we've been working on a new feature called People Focus, uh, which makes better utilization of the overall re real estate. And I'm going to show you that. So this is the normal view. And I'm going to switch to turn on People Focus. As you can see, what People Focus just did was it, it, it zoomed into the speakers. And if they were to move around, by the way, it's going to move around with them. It's making better use of that real estate. But let's take this further. Let's, uh, let's have a meeting room now join that space. So what you just saw is a meeting room join that space. And now we are allocating more space, an ultra-wide view of the room, because that allows people in that room to be included. And we've got the team from Oslo late at night still uh, on, on, uh, in the office. And I've got Shnara, who runs our devices team, joining us. Shnara, how's it going? What's, uh, how are things out there? Hi, David, and uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to Oslo, and uh, great to see you guys in Vegas. You've been working on some enhancements to People Focus, so why don't you show us that? You know what? It's really great. You can see I'm tucked uh, back here in the corner, really small, and, you know, we've had uh, Best View and, uh, and Speaker Track for a while, but now we have People Focus World Multiple Streams. So, uh, Miriam, please enable, uh, uh, please enable that. And what you will see now is that all of a sudden, when we enable that, wow. we get a, a, a page sheet. Look at this. And we are eye height, even if I'm standing up and they're sitting. And let me just roam a little. And what you will see is that it will track me. And if I walk very close to Miriam here, what you will see is that all of a sudden it detects that as well, and we go into one frame. Isn't that amazing, Gary? That is just awesome. That's such a great improvement. Now, one of the other things, Snara, you've been working on is a brand new whiteboard uh, that we just launched earlier. Can, can, you, can you show us that? Yes, we can. So uh, the whole key we see at the moment is the need for visual collaboration. And we now have a pervasive whiteboarding function. I'm here on my iPad. Javid is there on, on the board. And let's uh, do some whiteboarding together. We have basically the product lifecycle up here. And, uh, you know, I think our agenda here has been uh, work from in progress. I can move, move that over to complete. Good progress. Yeah, and uh, you know, we can do a little bit of annotation, stuff like that. And then we're working now across from here, but let me uh, do something fun as well. I think you want to see what you guys look like from, uh, from this end. And uh, here you see it, and uh, uh, we now add rich content as well, and uh, there is the image, David. Oh, look at that. So that's what Snara was seeing at the far end. So we've added uh, images support to our whiteboard. So what you're seeing here is whiteboarding capabilities available both in a physical whiteboard and a, uh, and a app. And it's available not just in a meeting. It's available outside of a meeting. Uh, so really excited about those improvements that, we, that Snara and team are making. Thank you so much, Snara. I hope to see you in Vegas next time around. Thank you. Have fun. Now, we've always been known for our rich experiences in the conference room. We've got a complete set of all-in-one integrated video solutions, including the room panorama that's on the screen over there. But if you've made an existing investment in your conference room, you've got monitors and TVs, the room kit uh, nicely works with your existing screens and your existing investment. And just last month, we announced the latest addition to our room portfolio, the WebEx Room Bar. So let's take a look at a video of the new device.
that's the new room bar. We actually have one of those down on the show floor, so if you want to play with it, uh, head down to the show floor. As you just saw, whether you're joining from your laptop with one of our headsets or our cameras or our beautiful collaboration devices, we've got you covered, whether you're at the home or at the office. Now let's talk about flexible work styles. And to kick off this discussion, I wanted to take a look at the results of the second question that we asked you in Slido. Where do you spend most of your time during your workday? Looks like the people spending a lot of time in team meetings. Now, all of these interactions, though, that, we, that, that, that you just mentioned, they are not all created equal. They require different levels of pre preparation, engagement, and management. So my 10-person team meeting is very different from a 10-person board meeting. The stakes are way higher with that board meeting. Similarly, my staff meeting is very different from my 5,000-person all hands. It requires a different level of engagement. And finally, there are events like this, where there is both in-person and virtual participants. These interactions all require different kinds of tools. And we must think of these interactions differently. That is why we've packed the WebEx suite with a whole new set of tools that go beyond just meetings. But let me first just start with a phone call. Many of our day-to-day -day interactions still start with a good old-fashioned phone call. And our cloud calling solution, WebEx Calling, now has 6 million subscribers and counting. And all of the innovations you just saw, we are integrating that into WebEx Calling. So all of the noise reduction technology you, you, that, you, that you saw earlier is now included in WebEx Calling. In addition, we've added a few additional toots, tools to the WebEx suite. We now have support for large-scale events like this one, thanks to our socio acquisition. And with Witcast, you can communicate with video asynchronously with your audience. And then engaging your audience has never been easier with Slido. You just saw that in action. So all of these tools, including message, meet, call, now included in WebEx Suite. When you combine that WebEx Suite with the collaboration devices that, that I just showed you, you get an incredible hybrid work experience. But I know many of you are asking, all that's great, Javed, but how does IT manage and facilities deliver these experiences? So to tell you more about that, I'm going to invite Chris Story, SVP and GM of Networking Experiences on stage. Chris? All right. Thank you, Javed. I continue to just be blown away by not just the innovation that our collaboration team is bringing out, but also how these all work together in really seamless ways to deliver on experiences for our users. Because that's what it's all about. We have to deliver amazing experiences for our users. And as Javed said, my name is Chris Story. I lead the networking experiences team. We're bringing together Cisco's Enterprise Networking, Catalyst, DNA Center, the Meraki team, and our Cisco Industrial Networking IoT team all together in one. And our vision as the networking experience team is to transform customers' experiences by delivering powerful and secure technology. And to do this, we're bringing together the best technologies for managing and deploying your networks in new ways to enable the campus of the future. The world of hybrid work that we're talking about here, obviously, I don't have to tell you, dramatically different than the world we had before. But not only that, it's continuing to evolve. It's continuing to change. We have to continue to adopt, and our networks are exactly the same. As many of us have learned, we cannot solve this with collaboration alone. You know, there's policies, there's, there's processes, there's way that, ways that we work together, we're even having to like re-envision how we use the campus. And we need to have networks that are able to adapt and change in response to that. And two years of hybrid work for people working at home, for, for many of us, you know, really created different expectations for our users when we go back and we have to deliver networking services to them. Gigabit speeds to devices, the ability to bring whatever you want to your network because you controlled that network at your home. You know, being able to use SaaS whenever you wanted to in order to make sure that 
you were as, as effective as you could be as an employee, well, now the networks in the office and at home need to be able to respond to that. You need to make sure that people are productive from anywhere and can connect from any place at any time. And we need to do that securely, efficiently, and reliably. Now let's talk through three ways that Cisco's helping to make this hybrid work a practical reality for you and your teams. So first up, reimagining the campus with physical and virtual data. Javed showed you DNA spaces. I love this. It's a fantastic way to start to bring the power of the data that you already have in your networks and on your sites together. There we go, it was real. I got a little nervous, I will admit. I got a little nervous there. All right, it came up. Java showed you how he could you know, quickly get to a room and, and find a room that he wanted to get to. I could find that room. But not only that, I could see what the air quality is in that room. I could see temperature. I could see humidity. I can see the ambient noise, quiet. I can see it's empty. I can see no one's in there. No one's squatting in that room, and it's a big room. I can go get that room if I wanted to. We're stitching together data, again, that's already available to you in new ways. We're taking data from the Meraki devices in your network, from the Catalyst devices in your network, from your WebEx devices, bringing them all together to empower new use cases for you. You can see you know, the general information about this site. I can see the indoor air quality. I can see the two CO2 levels. And what's amazing about this technology is I can now stitch this technology together if I'm the facilities leader to be able to do things that you couldn't do before. I can, I can take that CO2 data and connect it with my HVAC units and kick on a fan if the CO2 level gets too high in a conference room. So with DNA spaces and your existing networks, you can do so much more with the data you already have. Bridging that digital and physical divide that's so present for all of us. Now, the next big challenge that we have is the expectations of our employees and executives on the expectations of how the network is operating itself. Now, that seamless experience that Javed showed you as he moved from the office into a car, uh, into his home, being able to do that, that all depends on the WAN connections working flawlessly. And increasingly, as Gartner points out, by 2025, 40% of all enterprise locations will use direct internet access as their primary transport. That creates huge challenges for us as IT professionals, making sure that we continue to deliver those experiences and that connectivity that is gonna allow our users to be able to succeed. And when we think about, as IT professionals, what's super important, and that is you know, the, I, the ability to control and manage devices through a single pane of glass. And you know, being able to do this through the WebEx control hub, you, know, you can control your hardware and your software, and now, we have integrations with thousand eyes to be able to see that WAN transport layer, to be able to make sure that we bring the insights and connectivity that can really ensure a positive experience for our users. Because if they don't have a great experience with the WAN, that collaboration experience, no matter how amazing we make those products, is not gonna be as good as it should be. So what we strive to do is to make these intelligent, automated, and most importantly, simple by bringing them together in one. And that doesn't stop with Thousand Eyes. Thousand Eyes, we are also bringing this together in the Meraki platform. So now, with Thousand Eyes, you can see directly from the Meraki dashboard what's going on in your WAN connections to be able to better troubleshoot and see what's going on. In addition, we can use WAN insights and web app health directly in the Meraki dashboard. 
eliminating that swivel chair, making sure that you can start to see what's going on with your applications, how they're performing, being able to make sure you can get to Office 365 and Gmail and be able to track that all in a single pane of glass, delivering that simplicity and IT agility that we know we need to deliver for our teams. All right, so the final example I want to talk about here is finding better ways now to manage this you know, massively expanded network that we have that includes all those remote sites that you have called people's homes now, as well as you know, far more diversity in the sites that you're operating. And I was so thrilled to see Todd be able to launch this morning the Meraki management and Meraki monitoring of Catalyst devices. And so in here now, through the Meraki dashboard, you have the ability to manage catalyst switching and monitor catalyst devices that you want to continue to manage on-prem, but want to be able to pipe that data into the Meraki dashboard. This hybrid world allows you, you know, or we need to be able to stitch this type of data to deliver against the use cases that the hybrid world challenges all of us with. And it's the true power that we can deliver through integrations like this when we bring Meraki and Catalyst together that makes it an unbelievably exciting time for us here on the Networking Experiences team. So with these multiple sites, you know, we, we have to do this ourselves. This example I gave here, One Pen Plaza, DNA Spaces, using Catalyst top to bottom. We have these same boards at the Meraki offices in San Francisco using Meraki top to bottom. We need to be able to bring these things together for our teams by unlocking the power of our platforms. Hybrid work is all about working smarter and working in more engaging ways and being able to move faster. And this is true for our IT teams. And we want to enable this world where IT is not just the network that supports it. We create these experiences that allow us to have amazing hybrid work experiences. So, in summary, this is an unbelievably exciting time. We're making hybrid work happen here, both with our collaboration tools and our networking tools, bringing them all together so you can do more with what you already have today. So, I invite you to join tomorrow morning's keynote with G2 and Todd to see where else this is going. Please visit us in the world of solutions. See these hybrid work innovations up close, WebEx, Thousand Eyes, cloud management and cloud monitoring for Catalyst devices. Visit the IT operations center for how we actually bring this together, how you really manage these things. So. Thank you for the time today. Javed and I are thrilled that we can continue to deliver these innovations, and we're going to continue to deliver those innovations as hybrid work evolves over time, and you're asked to do more with what you have already today. Thank you so much. Wow, wow. We just heard an amazing session from Javed and Chris talking about the seamless transition, right? How we're optimizing our workspaces to work seamlessly at home, at the office, anywhere, right? The keynote too was just full of so many gems. I feel like every time I'm listening to our executives speak, I'm writing notes. Like I'm just heavily just trying to keep up with all of the great content that's coming out. One of my favorite quotes that goes perfectly with the session we just heard from earlier today was, if you're serious about connectivity, then you have to be serious about protection. And that came from uh, G2 earlier. I think I got that right. But uh, super excited. I know Alex is somewhere out there on the floor. I actually have, uh, I, see, I see him, I think. Alex, you out there? Well, I am indeed. Cool. What's going on out How's there? How's it going? Hey, Lauren, how's it going? Yes, I'm over here participating, looking through some magazines we got here. We got some reading material. Uh, looks like we're going to look for some, I some icons or people or images that we like. But we're actually going to make some pins out of this. So if you want to come over here to make some buttons and some pins and something to add to your lanyard for some flair, who doesn't like a bunch of flair on their, their lanyard there? 
We have all these different pre-printed icons you can always cut out and make a pin with. Or if you want your own image, or there's something in a magazine that you like that you want to be add, add on here, maybe someone's headshot or some scenery, you can go ahead and do that. So let's make a, a pin here at the, the station. So I'm going to put the metal backing here, put a little symbol on top for I Love Cisco Live. We're going to put a clear seal on that, rotate it over. This is all manual power. Okay, pressing hard. Okay, now we're going back, swing it around. We have the backing of this piece. Flip that on the side. Smash it again with all your might. Okay, this is tougher than like an espresso machine. Whoa, I don't know if I can get that back up. Ugh, too far down. Let's swing it back. Woo, perfect. Looks like I got my pin. I can put it on my shirt or my lanyard. How does that look? I love Cisco Live. What do you think, Lauren? Is that is that nice? Do you want That's, this on your lanyard? I actually, it's like you just, I don't know if you teleported it over to me, but I have one too. You do? Nice. I love Cisco Live. I don't know how the how we did that, but the team is magic and they brought this over to me too, so I'm gonna wear this proudly. I am a Cisco Ciscoian, happy to be at Live. So I'm I'm super excited. Uh, we also have some 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 things we're gonna talk about. Some, some net vets, the net vet lounge is here. We're celebrating them. I also have Rob up here with me. That I'm can... here whenever you need me. I have my own pin made up, so rock and roll. <laughs> We're having a good time. We are here. We are here. And we also are going to have one of my favorite sessions I've been waiting a long time for with Eric Nip, VP Global Systems Engineering, Denise Lee, VP of Engineering Sustainability Office at Cisco, and Bob Cicero, America's Smart Building Leader. They're going to show us and tell us all about how Cisco Solutions can help your journey to net zero. Let's roll it. Welcome to Cisco Live. How good does it feel to be back in person? All right. Sustainability is not a new topic. You don't have to look very far to see a record high or low in temperature or a climate emergency right in your backyard. It is the most existential challenge that faces our world today. The time is now. For those of you who are staying at the ARIA, climate reality is just wrapping up, training another 500 leaders. It's a priority for everyone and businesses around the world. We are all trying to get to net zero. Cisco actually committed last November at the United Nations COP26 to get to net zero by 2040. I would love to see a show of hands. How many of your corporations have set a goal to net zero? A few. Um, how many people in the audience know what scope one, two, and three means? Perfect. Well, welcome, and I'm glad you're here. 2015, at the Paris Agreement, the Global House Emission Protocol helped us with some standards and some definitions on how to measure greenhouse gas emissions. They organized it into scope one, two, and three. Scope one and two is essentially what it takes to operate your business day to day, including running your networking equipment, lighting, et cetera. Scope three is use of goods sold. It's everything else in your supply chain, up and downstream. And the cool thing about, if you consider what that means, Cisco's scope three is many of our customers' scope two. There's an inherent checks and balances into the system. So when we think about that, Cisco's scope three accounts for 99% of our emissions. We're all in this journey together. Cisco is continuing to invest in innovation. What does that mean? What does that look like? We are looking at our portfolio across our roadmap we are embedding it into our products, our offers, and solutions. One of my favorite things is to actually go and visit the labs and, and work with our fellows and our distinguished engineers on what's next. We'll get you a sneak peek a little bit later. But in, alongside that, we have to make sure that we're abiding by the compliances, the rules, the regulations, the certifications that are all constantly changing and evolving around us. Once upon a time, we actually put lead in paint and we put asbestos in our ceilings. And then we realize it's not so good for us. Then it was up to your company, your organizations, your households on how fast you were going to remove that from your ecosystem. With sustainability and environmental, it's actually not so different. 
the ESG materiality that's coming out, the lessons that we're learning on what's good or bad for carbon emissions is, is fast becoming integrated into these regulations and these certifications. So we're making sure that we're working alongside these protocols so that the things that we're building, circular design, what's going into our products are all embedded. So here's the big question. What does your plan look like if you even have a plan? I would love to see a show of hands if your companies are doing something today that you would consider a plan. Some more? OK, good. Well, it's a start. McKinsey did a study where 90% of the organization said, yes, we know sustainability is important. And yet only 60% of them have a plan. In conversations I've had with customers and partners over the last couple of months, plans range from manually reporting and manually measuring at the end of every month energy consumption and usage of all their boxes and networking equipment in their data centers and in their buildings, one end of the spectrum. Fast forward for more mature companies, I've seen companies completely from the ground up organically build dashboards that are automated in doing all of that. The spectrum is wide, and all that's important is that you have a plan and you're getting started. One of, the, one of the stats that I love so much about this in the McKinsey study was that there will be one, or, sorry, $2.15 trillion in renewable energy investments happening over the next couple of years by 2025. And that's just in renewable energy. So you can continue to count on Cisco throughout your journey to net zero, wherever you are. We know that it's a journey, and we know that we're working on these solutions. And I'm very excited to introduce and bring to you today my good friend Eric Knipp, who's going to deep dive into Sustainable Data Center. Um, Eric is our Vice President of Systems Engineering for the Americas. Eric. Thanks very much. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> good morning, everybody. So Denise just said something that I think was very profound. She said that climate change, sustainability, they represent an existential challenge. And organizations of all sizes are beginning to recognize that. Investors are choosing how they invest in companies. Corporate boards are looking into sustainability initiatives, things we've already talked about. It's the right thing to do for the environment, for society, but it's also the smart business decision to make. Recently, Accenture conducted a survey among, amongst companies and found that companies that had engaged in a thoughtful, a actual, um, I would say, intentional sustainability initiative outperformed their peers by 21% on a profitability standpoint. So it's not only good business, it's smart business. Yet, intentions aren't necessarily gelling with reality. Of the organizations that were surveyed, only 43% had actually gone on that intentional journey. So there's a lot of ground that needs to be made up. And before we talk about everyone else, it's probably a good idea for us to look in the mirror first, as an industry, about our own impact. Let's frame up what we're dealing with. By the end of this year, there will be 29 billion devices accessing the global internet. Think on that for just a second. That means that for every human being alive, there are 3.7 devices. Think about your own lives. Everything that's connected in your home, the number of devices on you right now, it's not that hard of a number to consider. And over the course of just the next three years, another 10 billion will come online. And by the end of this decade, and I love doing this by the way, by the end of this decade, there will be 100 billion devices accessing the global internet. Anything that can be connected will be connected. Science fiction is gonna become science fact when we start to think about drone deliveries, augmented reality, virtual reality. All of those devices are creating an incredible amount of bandwidth. In fact, bandwidth grew in 2020 alone by 40%. And when we drive bandwidth consumption, we drive, we drive energy utilization with those telcos. In fact, the world's telcos represent 2 to 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions today. This is one of the reasons that Cisco took a, took a very, very firm stand on this and launched the Silicon One platform. It's a next generation ASIC 
that powers our Cisco 8000 internet backbone router. This router ha is, is, and I could geek out on this all day long, is one of the most impressive, uh, one of the most impressive routers ever built. It's actually the highest scale router ever, ever created. It can, a single port of this platform can provide bandwidth or the aggregate bandwidth needs of 4,000 average American households. In fact, one chassis can fuel the bandwidth needs of the entire city of Chicago. Impressive. What does this have to do with sustainability? What if I were to tell you that it was 96% more energy efficient than the previous generation of our service provider routing platform? So we're not only driving the next generation of the world's bandwidth needs, but we're doing it sustainably. In fact, it is the lowest cost per kilobit from a power standpoint uh, router or, or SP routing platform on, in the industry. Now, what does that have to do with data centers? Because that same technology is now finding its way into the enterprise data centers. So the technology that is fueling and driving the bandwidth needs of the largest networks in the world, the internet backbone, the web scalers, is now available, to your, now available in the private data center. And there's four innovations that we're gonna talk about this week that are, gonna be, that are gonna line around that sustainability initiative. And the first is the Nexus 9800. Launching it formally tomorrow, available in our world of solutions today. The Nexus 9800 brings the Silicon One uh, technology into the enterprise data center, driving that 400 gigabit connectivity today at a much, much lower <clears throat> energy utilization and power utilization effectiveness than any other platform in its, uh, any, any predecessor platform. Second is the next generation of our UCS platform, the UCSX, representing an 11% reduction in total power consumption, but also a much, much smaller uh, footprint in the data center when we think about rack space, which is increasingly important. Now, the third area that we need to focus on in the largest actual utilizer or, or, or consumer of power in the data center is cooling. In fact, about 50% of data center costs come from cooling alone. And if you've ever spent a late night in a data center, three o'clock in the morning, they get really cold, trust me, I've been there. You wanna take a sweatshirt. Because we, we need to engineer for the worst case scenario. Or do we? By arming our data center operations teams with simple IoT technology, simple temperature, temperature sensors, sensors that are available in uh, tying that with analytics through our Meraki platform, we can actually dynamically adjust heating and cooling zones in the enterprise data center, reducing energy consumption for cooling by 20 to 50%. And it's a simple, small device that just hangs from the ceiling. And then finally, another very big uh, announcement that we're making this week is Nexus Cloud. Nexus Cloud is our next generation data center networking element manager. And it's gonna bring analytics and real-time operations into the enterprise data center through a cloud platform. It's gonna let us do predictive maintenance. It's gonna actually tie in directly to our, our TAC organization for predictive, uh, predictive um, maintenance fixes, things such as that. But it's also one of the first enterprise data center management platforms built for sustainability. Day one at launch, it will give you direct uh, visibility into energy consumption and cost it specifically ties and tracks greenhouse gas emissions on the devices that it's managing and make sure the devices are staying within conformance. And it gives you specific metrics on power utilization effectiveness. So again, when we tend to think about data center management, we like to talk about how we manage the elements. What Cisco is doing with the Nexus Cloud launch, and this will inform other launches that we make in the future, is tying that sustainability directly into how we're managing this platform. Ultimately, tying to our inclusive future for all, and ultimately taking our accountability and our ownership in driving a sustainable future and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. With that, I want to hand it to my good friend, Bob Cicero, the America's leader for our Smart Buildings Initiative. Bob? Do this. Do this. Great to be back live, as we all mentioned. When we think about buildings, buildings are a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, 70% of most cities, the energy is utilized by buildings. Likewise, we think about our own portfolios from an enterprise standpoint. 
Most of you in the audience, your organizations, probably a significant portion of your emissions is from buildings. When we think about buildings, buildings also contributed to 10 gigatons of CO2 emissions in 2019. 10 gigatons, think about that as a stat. And we think about the Paris Agreement and what we want to get to net zero as a collective by 2050. We now need to accelerate emission drop by 60% by 2030. 60% by 2030. I think we would all agree that we can't continue to do the same thing. We need to fundamentally transform the way that we design and construct buildings. What we at see at Cisco is technology becoming that fourth utility from a building standpoint. And there's three key aspects that we focus on. When we think about sustainability, we all want to get to that net zero goal. But in order to get to that net zero goal, we need to fundamentally rethink how we design and construct space. The second element is convergence, a common term that we've used for years. But this is the convergence of the IT and the OT environment coming together inside of buildings. I'll talk about that a lot more. And the last piece is data driven. We have thousands of data points that exist today in the products that we produce that all of you use. When we think about the data element, the thousands of points that are possible, if we could use Wi-Fi as a sensor to understand occupancy inside of this space, if we could use our WebEx room kits to count people inside of the room, I now have real-time data about what's happening in the built environment. In addition to that, we start thinking about other technologies where we've, bit, we've built sensors into everything that we do from an access point standpoint, from a WebEx room kit standpoint. So these data sources are vast, and they're gonna come at you from the standpoint of thinking about how do we tie these together to build a better environment. I would mentioned the convergence of IT and OT. For years, we think about the convergence element, moving voice over to the IP network, video over to the IP network. A lot of that was data driven. What's different now is that we are taking these built environment components that are around us everywhere and moving them over to the infrastructure, just not for data, but for power. When we released UPoE Plus 90 watt power over ethernet, we are now taking the built environment and moving that over to the infrastructure. Fundamentally, that transforms and gives us a power efficiency that we have never seen in a built environment before. So we can take that and use that to be able to drop our emissions. The other byproduct of that is thinking about the material costs that go into side of buildings. And we think about embodied carbon, you'll hear that consistently. From an embodied carbon standpoint, wouldn't it be great if we could remove thousands of pounds of steel and hundreds of pounds of copper? And we'll talk a little bit about that. The, second lead, the first leading element from the standpoint of utilization inside of space is typically to heat and cool a space. Very comfortable in here today. It's very comfortable from the standpoint of temperature standpoint. But thinking about the data element that I mentioned before, what if we could use that data that's at our fingertips that we have already today to be able to impact and change the way that we heat and cool buildings. That's possible today and that's what we're doing. From a safety and security standpoint, we think about classic use cases of safety and security, but now when we think about what we've been through as over the past two years from a COVID standpoint, we now care about air quality. We now care about maximizing natural daylight for all of us as individuals inside of buildings. Fundamentally, the network is providing either the sensory components or the connectivity side of it. Wrapping all of this together, we are gonna be driving intelligent experiences that we have never ever seen before in the built environment. And the combination of all these technologies together will have a profound impact on each one of us as we enter these new spaces. I mentioned sustainability side of it. Two sides of the equation. When we think about moving all of these elements over to the network, we are moving them over to a low voltage environment. Yes, I have the operation expense, OPEX side of it from the standpoint of being more efficient and be able to tune in my loads from a building standpoint and the demand side, but now I also have the other piece of it. I am fundamentally transforming the way that we built environments. I'm removing thousands of pounds of steel and thousands of pounds of copper out of projects. The data behind me is actually normalized on a 100,000 square foot basis, but again, we are changing the way that we're designing and constructing. We look at the built environment, we really see new spaces being developed and really centered around five key areas and what's happening from an enterprise standpoint. 
The first is the hybrid agile space experience. Everyone is somewhere on the journey from a hybrid standpoint. What we see in the built environment, a space that's built for hybrid work is a fundamentally different space that you're building. You might hear in industry, it's more about the we space and not the me space. But those elements coming together are gonna to create those agile space experiences. The second is health and safety. Mentioned before from a health and safety standpoint, we think about security cameras, fantastic, but we also look at what's happening from an air standpoint. So we're embedding these sensors and these components into the infrastructure where the network becomes that reporting mechanism. Likewise, even maximizing natural daylight from the standpoint of thinking about as us as human beings, we want to work where it's great daylight. That's just a fact. The third piece is space utilization. From a space utilization standpoint, talked a little bit about the data journey before. Think about the world of taking Wi-Fi information in combination with WebEx room kits, in combination with our Meraki surveillance cameras that yes, are great surveillance cameras, but they're counting people as well. And then down to the desk level when you look at some of the WebEx technology from a hub standpoint. The combination of all these elements are coming together for us to truly digitize real estate. Real estate has fundamentally never been digitized before. Our lives have been digital over the past two years. Everything we do is digital. Now we have the opportunity to digitize real estate. The fourth piece is the optimization and the automation side of it. When we think about the built environment and we think about the maximizing the per square foot utilization of space, this entire architecture comes together with the network being that fundamental platform from a PoE standpoint, bringing that together. And then the last piece is, of course, is net zero goals. We need to get to the point where we have the supply side and the demand side canceling each other out to truly get to net zero, and that's what the smart building aspect is about. Not only from the standpoint of Cisco, we're repositioning our real estate portfolio globally to take advantage of hybrid work, but what are we doing in terms of looking at those five key elements I mentioned in the previous slide, and how are we bringing that to life? So this is our first talent and collaboration center that Cisco has built. This happens to be in Midtown Manhattan. It's 40,000 square feet from a usable square footage standpoint. We replatform this entire space over to low voltage. Everything in this space, from a lighting standpoint, from a shading standpoint, all the HVAC controls, again, to change that first utilization cost from the standpoint of the OPEX side of it, all of that is the network. The next piece is that we're grabbing all this data and pulling it all together from the disparate sources that I talked about before. And then finally, we're integrating these assets all together in terms of this IT and OT building management system coming together, of course, with partners, and then also leveraging DNA spaces as being that aggregation platform to take literally 5,000 data points out of this 44,000 square feet. So if you could scan that QR code, you'll see on the world of solutions, there's a VR experience that's been created to give you a sense of this space. And with that, I'd like you to roll the video. Today, businesses have to create workspaces that attract and retain the best talent, ensure employee well-being, and support their net zero journey. These spaces also have to adapt to more hybrid, flexible ways of working. At the core of today's real estate strategies is digital transformation. The ability to deliver an exceptional employee experience while measuring and optimizing your real estate portfolio is now the new norm. The use of data and technology to optimize and transform your real estate portfolio is the foundation for unlocking the true value of space. Cisco understands the evolving demands in today's real estate market, and we can help you with your digital real estate transformation journey. Between building a real estate strategy that meets today's needs and embracing digital transformation for tomorrow, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. All right, Eric and Bob the Builder, I just have one really important question. Can we build it? Yes, yes we, we can. can. <laughs> All right, there's some parents out in the audience, I hope. <laughs> so I don't know about you, but I'm ready for my tour of One Penn Plaza. I'm actually heading to New York straight after this. So if anyone is in New York next week or thereafter, Bob, Bob's there, but we'll be there, and you're welcome to join us on the tour. We're just a week away. Um, all right, now let's, let's talk about making it real. And beyond the solutions and the products themselves, Cisco's actually done quite a bit to embed circular consumption um, and end-to-end -end net zero programs to help our customers and our partners. So let's talk through some of them. 
Um, Bob, I know you work with a lot of customers on our Take Back program that was recently extended uh, last year. Can you tell us a little bit about it? This is probably one of the most utilized you know, opportunities that we see. So when we think about repositioning real estate, and a lot of the times rebuilding space, there's a lot of embed embodied carbon that exists as well as the, you know, the electronic side of it. So we consistently see all the time customers taking advantage of the take back and reuse program to be able to take that back, dispose of it properly, but also more importantly is on the reuse side and the recycling side. So that's a key element in terms of that goes into that sustainability wheel that anytime someone is looking at the total impact of building new space. So what I love about this program is it's, it's free for all customers, for all products, and 99.9% .9 of everything that comes back is recycled or reused. Um, Eric, talk to us a little bit about Cisco Refresh. I know this program's been around for a long time, but when you look at it with the sustainability lens, it has a little bit of a different meaning. Tell, oh, tell us some more. Absolutely, I think it's the best kept secret within Cisco, and, and it's exactly what the name implies. We, we take, again, gear from the reuse programs, uh, the take back programs, uh, other customer lifecycle programs, we completely recertify it, completely refurbish it, get the code current on it, and then it's available for customers to leverage. So again, that, that gear that may be one generation old but still has a lot of useful life, instead of ending up in a landfill, it's, it's available for our customers at a really, really deep discount. It's available right now in 70 countries, and uh, again, if we're thinking about global supply chain challenges, being able to get gear for, for uh, site openings and things like, such as that, it's been a great tool. So we have flexible consumption where we're looking more and more into hardware as a service. If you're in the Amir region or you're tuning in from Amir, we've piloted a program called Green Pay, which gives you further discount for circular consumption. And all of our partners now have a sustainability specialization. So a lot to dig in there. Um, let's look forward a little bit. We're going to give you a sneak peek for coming in and kicking off Cisco Live with us today and this week uh, into what's next. I mentioned earlier on we are investing in innovation. If you want to look into the future and what that looks like um, from a technology standpoint, there are a few things that you see here on the slide um, that we are heavily investing in and that we are gearing up to roll out over the next couple of months uh, and quarters. Bob, tell us a little bit about when we talk about renewable energy systems. We know we, we've heard this term energy independence more and more and more in DC microgrids. Tell us a little bit more. Yes, when you think about the convergence opportunity I mentioned before, moving all of the components to the network, We've essentially taken the DC devices and moved them over, the, over to the infrastructure on the demand side. On the, on the supply side, when you think about renewables, renewables are actually generating DC energy. But then you further dive into the supply side and think about micro sources of energy in combination with macro sources of energy coming together inside of the infrastructure to take the supply side that could be generated on site and then feed it into the infrastructure that is taking care of the demand side. So fundamentally is, is that the combination of those two elements is really the platform from a DC microgrid standpoint in terms of truly getting to where supply, demand cancels each other out to get to that net zero world. What's so exciting when you, when you consider a it, it, perfect example in smart buildings is you have these IT and OT, OT infrastructures continuing to have more and more applications and use cases. But then you consider the, the transfer of electricity and energy through all of that. So now, we, now we're getting into this business of energy networking, which we've already doing with, with power over ethernet. And there, there's just more and more possibilities when we think about the technology that's coming. So we wanna leave you today with what are some tangible actions you can be thinking about? We covered a lot of ground from the data center to the campus to your, to your offices and, and everything in between. Looking at your product energy efficiency, learning how you can baseline it, understand the scope methodology and the terminology around what, where your biggest pain points and opportunities are to put a dent in your, in your net zero journey. How do you lower power consumption? How do you do that in a more automated way, leveraging the data points that, um, that both Bob and Eric talked about in the data center and on the campus? And we're all starting to figure out, and we're still learning into hybrid work, all of these use cases can help further and accelerate uh, with the use of technology. And we hope you can take advantage of more of these recycle, uh, refresh, and, re and reuse programs, um, and more and more will be coming. And last but not least, uh, I don't think I have to remind you that uh, Cisco is powering an, an inclusive future for all. The, part, the inflection point that we're at right now is that technology is not only for good, it's good for the planet, but it's also getting to that tipping point where it's very good for business. And I want you to think really hard about that because as we start to pivot into adjacent markets and new business models, 
the opportunities to embed sustainability as an accelerator to help us all on this journey for net zero uh, really is one mission and one purpose. So I want to thank you again for being here today. I want to let you know that this is just the start of many sustainability sessions embedded throughout Cisco Live. So feel free to, uh, to scan this QR code and, and track your journey and all the other events um, to help you get smart, learn, plan. And we look forward to seeing you at more sessions. Thanks so much for coming. All right, welcome back. We are on the show floor, and this is going to be quick. Things are coming fast. We've got lots of great information for you. I want to bring Lauren on. She is out in front of, it looks like, the Ford Mustang. That is so awesome. So I have to tell you, from the keynote this morning, Lauren, um, Jim was talking about a refocus for Ford, which at first my dad brain goes, oh, Ford's focused, but it's a refocus. Regardless, the point is, Ford is saying that they're less, it's less about manufacturing and more about becoming a digital product. And that whole aspect of Ford and how Cisco is helping them do that, and this, these kind of partnership examples are awesome. What's one thing, I've only got like 30 seconds or so, but what's one thing you remember from the keynote that you say, I need to repeat this for others? I remember hearing just how WebEx is powering the hybrid work environment for Ford and even the inside of some of the technology. I don't want to steal the thunder, but WebEx is really a lot, bringing some brains into the functionality of this this unit here, so I'm super excited about that. And this is going to be my next car. Oh, I've yeah. been sold. Everything I heard in the keynote, this is most absolutely going to be the car. I actually want to ride off in this one if I can. Well, I'm a big fan. I got my Ford F-150. I got the hybrid 2021 that I'm just in love with. I love that car. Jim mentioned he got his promotion. He learned about his promotion on a WebEx DX80. That's partnership, baby. Ford yes. is in deep with Cisco, it's awesome. Guys, coming up right now, we've got hybrid cloud. So some of the details that we heard about earlier, you're going to get them now. Let's go take a look with Didi and Ish and the rest of the team. All right, welcome, good morning. Cisco Live is live again, which is incredible. So thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with us today. I'm so excited to be here to talk to you about unlocking the possibilities of hybrid cloud. We've got a great, we're going to try to pack a lot here into the next 30 minutes um, and just kind of cover a lot of ground. So one of the great things about my job is that I get to spend a lot of time talking with customers, with partners, and the two things that I have are incredibly consistent in those conversations are these two things, the increasing complexity and the increasing pace of that change and that complexity in the hybrid cloud environment. So I want to share with you a couple of statistics just for, just for context. 92% of organizations are using multi-cloud. This is, you know, we can't get 92% of everybody to agree on anything except this. And it is, high, the, the distributed enterprise multi-cloud is a reality. The second statistic is 58% of you, 58% of our customers move workloads from on-prem to the cloud and back every week. Think about that for a moment. It is, it is not a debate as to what the environment's going to be. It is a multi-cloud, hybrid cloud environment, and it has this increasing pace and complexity, and we see this with all of our customers. So let's t think about the challenge. Like A few years ago, the, the challenge was everything that, we, everything that our customers had was controlled within the four walls of their data center. But with the expansion of multi-cloud and hybrid cloud, these assets, these workloads have exploded across the internet. And the hybrid, the hybrid distributed enterprise creates a ton of challenges, new challenges, but it doesn't release you from the traditional challenges of availability of applications, security, conformance to your policies and new challenges like how do we meet our net zero goals and sustainability. It's incredibly, an incredible amount of challenges and complexity. So in cloud networking, we think about this and we talk about, we talk about this with our customers. Our customers need you know, a cloud managed, cloud delivered operating model that deals with connectivity across clouds and within clouds. And the traditional requirements for high performance infrastructure have not gone away. This is cloud networking today. So with that, we're so excited to announce two, two big announcements for us as a business. First is the Nexus 9800, 400, 800 gig ready, four and eight slot modular. This is the flagship of our, 
portfolio. We believe that this is going to be the seminal product for us for the, for the next decade and more. So very excited to introduce the new family of the, the new members of the Nexus family. And secondly, we're going to introduce Nexus Cloud. Nexus Cloud will be the simplest way to deploy, manage, and operate your cloud networks wherever your workloads reside. So with that, I want to just do a quick demo. Roll the tape. Introducing Nexus Cloud, where the agility of cloud meets the power of Nexus. It couldn't be easier to get started with simplified single sign-on. Begin your guided journey by adding your sites. Select Cisco ACI Fabrics or NXOS switches, and Nexus Cloud will automatically discover and onboard additional switches. Auto discovery of switches in your fabrics is unparalleled simplicity. When you add an ACI controller to be part of a site, Nexus Cloud will automatically claim all the switches in your fabric. If you select a single NXOS switch instead, Nexus Cloud will discover and claim other switches that are connected to it, so you don't have to manually add every switch into your network. After setup, Nexus Cloud Global View displays all sites to deploy, manage, and operate, radically simplifying your cloud and on-premises networking operations. Based on root cause analysis and correlation, anomalies are quickly identified and remediated. You can also see advisories, health status, and more, but that's not all. Detailed traffic distribution patterns give you complete visibility so you can observe, design, and plan your distributed networks. Nexus Cloud even helps you achieve your net zero sustainability goals and manage costs with real-time energy consumption trends. Visibility leads to insights and action. With the topology view, you can search for a switch or endpoint, dynamically display their details, and experience the easiest way to get unprecedented visibility into the health of your network, including switches, servers, VRFs, and subnets. Visibility also enables you to stay conformant, remediating issues with confidence. Nexus Cloud creates an upgrade workflow and performs the necessary checks to minimize downtime with its smart firmware upgrade capability. It can automate the entire fabric upgrade process, eliminating human error and saving precious time during the maintenance window. One click and you're done. Nexus Cloud, agility of cloud, power of Nexus. Okay, so thank you. We're so excited to be bringing this to market. Thank you. Nexus Cloud, powered by the Intersight platform, which Didi is going to talk us, to, uh, talk us through a little bit, just on these three things. Simplicity, complete visibility, and the, the ability to use the visibility to meet all of your existing and future goals, such as sustainability and journey to net zero. So with that, I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, Didi Deskupka. Hello, good morning, and welcome to Cisco Live. My name is Didi Dasgupta. I head product management for Cisco's cloud and compute business. I want to spend a few minutes with you talking to you about our cloud strategy. And at the heart of that strategy is Intersight. Intersight is Cisco's hybrid cloud, cloud native platform. It's been in market for about four years. Tens of thousands of customers, hundreds and thousands of devices being managed. And you just heard the great innovation that we announced today, which is Nexus Cloud, which means all of networking, network orchestration, network management, all now available on the Intersight platform. What makes Intersight special is two things. First off, it is SaaS, because we firmly believe that you should not be managing your management software. We can do that for you. And secondly, it takes a platform approach. What you see behind me on the screen, and I'll try to zoom in a little bit, is the platform approach. We are enabling not just network you know, monitoring, management, orchestration, but you see the infrastructure services that, is, that allows our customers to manage all of compute, storage, 
you can do workload optimization within and across a multi-cloud environment. Um, we've enabled modules like Terraform with a, with a feature called IST on Intersight. Even the cloud native aspects, the Kubernetes platform is all offered on Intersight. So it's really not a product, it is a platform. And you know, it took us a very short time to bring a lot of the network capability on top of Intersight because of that platform approach. And it is part of an overall suite and we really want to focus on bringing that unified experience for our customers. Unified experience, whether you're managing your network, storage, or compute. A unified experience, whether you're trying to monitor the environment, whether you're trying to optimize workloads, whether you're trying to do orchestration in this multi-cloud environment, and a unified experience irrespective of who is touching and tinkering with all of that infrastructure. Could be somebody from the network team, could be somebody from the compute team, could be somebody from the cloud operations or even DevOps organizations. And that's the power of Intersight. So next, how does this all manifest itself in your environment? Look, every customer's journey to the cloud is different. And so at Cisco, we have this mantra, which is your cloud, your way. We're here to help. We're here to enable you in that transformation, in that journey. And each one of your journeys is gonna look different because of the nature of your business, because of your customers, because of your employees, because of regulatory requirements that you might, might have in your, in your environment. But what we're here to help with is all of these different things that you're trying to enable to your customers in your environment, whether it's with business continuity, whether it's accelerating application development with test and dev environments, whether you're doing it for backup and archival, we call all of these use cases within the hybrid cloud environment. And that's what um, Cisco is enabling with the Intersight platform. And talking about customers, I have a super interesting customer that I want to talk to you about, and then we have somebody who's going to come join, up, uh, join us on stage. The name of the company is KBR, and a super exciting organization that helps governments and companies in fantastic engineering projects, operations projects, technology projects, things like op uh, operations warp speed, space exploration with NASA, and also uh, a lot of work being done in the clean energy uh, environment. So please join me in welcoming Jeff Hawks, who is the leader of compute and communications from KBR. Thank you, hey, Jeff, welcome. Thank you. Hey, so you've been using Intersight a little bit. Yeah. Tell us about yeah. your environment and how you're using Intersight. Yeah, so we've been using Intersight for the uh, last couple years now, and uh, we have Intersight uh, looking at our on-prem workloads globally throughout all over the world. We operate in 40 different countries. Uh, we have AWS, Azure workloads uh, inside of Intersight as well. So. So, that, that, so it's, it's truly a multi-cloud, you know, hybrid cloud environment. You've got your on-prem you know, data centers, yeah. the colos, all of these public clouds. Tell us a little bit more about the environment. Yeah, so within KBR, so we have, we have to operate in very low uh, bandwidth, high latency operations. So we have um, a lot of edge computing there. So we have Intersight monitoring those environments. We uh, definitely leverage the workload optimizer to make recommendations to go up and down uh, within our workloads, both on-prem and in the cloud. Uh, we do also leverage Intersight to synthesize uh, what the future would look like for us if we have to do an upgrade or if we're gonna get a new project on board in a certain location in that region. Uh, what do we have to do? How do we have to size it appropriately? So we do use Intersight to, to assist us with that as well. Intersight looks at our entire compute stack. So we have pure storage is plugged into there as well. We have. Um, uh, AppD is also feeding into Intersight, so we have that holistic view of, of the KBR environment, and as we run into challenges or unplanned features, as Josh was talking about, we leverage Intersight to uh, reduce that mean time to innocence between the teams, so when we bring the apps teams in and they say, hey, we're having a problem, usually they come to us and say, we need more memory, we need more bandwidth, and that's usually not the answer for their issue. So we do use Intersight to, to help us get the, the workload back up and running, the customer back up and running. That's awesome. Yeah. So let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about the hardware 
and the X series. Looks like you finally received your we X did. series. Congratulations. Yeah, we, we received it. It's much like the holidays, so <laughs> getting that present coming in. So the team right now, they're, they're unpacking, uh, unpacking it and racking it as we speak. We did uh, order uh, a large X series deployment. So with our X series, the initial deployment of it is for VDI for KBR. So we do have different uh, customers. So we support uh, government customers across the globe. We do support these engineering projects as DD was talking about. So we do have uh, 3D engineering, so uh, 3D views within projects so we can look into a site uh, that we're building. And we're using X-Series for that. So uh, NVIDIA G nodes inside of X-Series. Uh, we have engineering firms, I say firms, but uh, workloads uh, across the globe. So engineering centers across the globe for KBR. And X-Series is, uh, is running our, our 3D engineering environment to start and then more on VDI and, and, and then collapsing UCS and X-Series in the future. So That's awesome. Yeah. So I want to go back to something that I think is very close to everybody's given you know, what is going on in the world. Mm -hmm. Operation Warp Speed, and I know you were personally very much involved, and you know it was a huge undertaking. So tell us about that experience. Yeah, so within KBR, uh, one of our contracts that we support is under LogCap, and within LogCap, we did get a request to support Operation Warp Speed, so the deployment of the the vaccine for uh, the COVID response. We had to set up, uh, you know, kind of overnight, a bunch of networks um, across the United States to support that deployment. So. Um, also, we had uh, to support the Afghani refugees that we had coming, uh, coming back out of Afghanistan. We have, we call them office in a box kits, but these uh, Pelican cases um, filled with ISRs, UCS E-blades inside there, so that edge computing is, is kind of in this uh, rapid deployment kit. Some of the sites, again, uh, we're doing SATCOM links, so some of the locations we, we don't have an actual ISP, so we have to go and use SATCOM for that. Um, and we tried to standardize that, automate it, um, also get that view into Intersight, um, but overnight to support those events. So uh, if there's a hurricane, if there's a major event, uh, the government calls on us uh, under the LogCap project. Warp Speed was one of those that we leveraged uh, Cisco to help support. That's fantastic. Yeah. So what's, uh, what's next? What is, what is some of the big projects that you're working on and how can Cisco help? Yeah, so for you know, KBR, we are definitely being cloud agnostic, so you know, working across the globe, um, much like Josh was saying, we are working with our customers to figure out where do we need to be close to. So where's your data at, the bandwidth at? Uh, we have a huge SD-WAN rollout. KBR, we operate multiple different networks within our environment, just the way um, that we have to deal with uh, different regulatory uh, compliance. And for us, we are working on automating between uh, SD-WAN uh, on ramping into AWS, Azure, and uh, the ability where the customer doesn't have to, the apps teams, they don't have to make any configuration changes. It just comes in and out, um, letting Intersight to make the recommendation for us and not a human making the recommendation and just have it choose where that workload should live. So that's the next, next big thing for us is that removing the human from that decision-making process on where that workload belongs. So yeah. that's awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff, for, uh, yeah, for the partnership yeah, and enjoy it. the rest of the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, um, I think we're meeting after almost three years and it feels just great to be here and, and meet all of you in person. Um, after three years, the last time we were here was 2019. Um, and so we hope to see you again next year. But in the meantime, here's a little bit uh, of the technology that the cloud and compute business is working on. You heard a little bit about X-Series. It is the fastest growing server Cisco has ever built. And one of the reasons that makes it special is because it really blurs that line between what would be delivered on a Blade server versus a standard rack server. A couple of areas that I'd like to highlight. First off, it's the first server in this category that has 100 gig connectivity. It's the first and only um, server that does that. And we're gonna keep pushing the boundaries on that network connectivity. The technology that makes possible blurring this line between a rack, a rack server and a blade server, we're seeing a lot of customers, early adopters, um, that are using workloads like you know, VDI, like you mentioned, uh, which would traditionally be on, on, a, on, a, on a rack platform. We're seeing that blurring of lines because of this X-Fabric technology. Okay? And so that's the other area where we're really uh, doubling down on innovation. 
And sustainability, you've heard it a couple of times, you'll hear it throughout this week, is something Cisco is taken very, very seriously. And on the X series, I mean, one of the reasons why we call it the X series because it stands for number 10, we want this platform to be in your environment for the next decade. And just by that investment protection, instead of having to go through like three cycles of other servers, this, this stays in your environment and, and helps a lot with that power, cooling, even the physical weight of equipment, which you'll have to swap in and out over the next 10 years, X-Series just stands apart. On Hyperflex, the big thing we're working on is software only. So we've delivered in the past, so far we've delivered hyperconvergence on appliance, on our hardware. We are working on making that a pure software only and integrating with public cloud. So that's the, that's the big innovation that's coming on Hyperflex. On conversion infrastructures, this is all of our solutions with our storage partners like NetApp, like Pure Storage, like Hitachi and Dell and others. The big thing we're doing is we're enabling InnerSight on all of this equipment, which has been in the data center, almost you know, stranded capital serving one data center at a time. But as you heard from our customers, today there is no, there is no center in the data. That the whole concept of data center is gone. It's the public cloud, it's the edge, it's the colo, and of course the data center. Um, you know, your data center is where your data is. And so on the converged infrastructure, we're allowing and uh, enabling management of all of these converged infrastructure solutions through InnerSight. And that's the big thing that we're working on. And the moment you get InnerSight on the platform, you not only get just the orchestration capabilities, but like I talked about, you get the Kubernetes stack, you get all of the automation capability, you get workload optimizer. And so it really unlocks that power of these infrastructure in, the, in, in various data centers. And last but not least on InnerSight, we're, uh, we're doing a few things on the edge. A lot of you have told us there's no stringent requirements around sovereignty. That's the other thing. And last but not least, connecting it more tightly with public clouds and enabling a whole bunch of data services. So that's what's coming, and with that, uh, I'm gonna wrap up this session. You know, Ish and I, we, we meet lots of customers every year, and then we, hear, we ask them about their cloud journey. And this is a simple checklist that we've heard from you in terms of what are the three things you wanna look at as you embark or wherever you are on your cloud journey. The first one is build that cloud-ready infrastructure. That data center is not going away anytime soon. And so what you wanna do is, enable the right hardware, the right software, the right platforms, so that you can be cloud ready. The second thing where we've heard customers trip up is not having a consistent operating environment. You don't want these to, you don't want to operate these different infrastructure sources as islands of infrastructure. You want to look at a consistent operating model across the entire hybrid cloud spectrum. And last but not least, every application that's being built today is using cloud native paradigm. And so you want to really look at all the things you can do to accelerate the development and deployment of cloud native applications. With that, I'll end, close the session. There's a couple of call to actions here. If you want to take out your phone and just take a picture of that barcode, you'll know uh, how to spend the rest of your week. And with that, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the show. My name is Rob Boyd. Are you not entertained? Are you not having a good time? Well, I hope you are, because I am. So much information coming your way from everything kicking off the keynote, because we saw hints of it on the show floor, right? Lots of big announcements, stuff we're like, what does that mean? Catalyst in the cloud, I got to learn more about that. Full stack observability, we'll learn more about that in just a moment. In fact, teasing a few things coming up. First and foremost, please keep communicating with us. Hashtag Cisco Live. That is the way to both monitor, of course, what's going on in a lot of different ways. If you're, of course, the Cisco app and such like this, but also just for letting us know what you're experiencing. What is, what is your impression? What is, uh, what is happening in your life in regards to this show at that moment that you want to share with us? Please be bold, share that, and uh, pictures, videos, they're all welcome. Uh, coming up a little bit later, our closing keynote. Make sure I get this right. Yep, sure enough, my good friend, because I think she let, would let me say that, Sherry Slate is going to be doing a closing keynote, uh, keynote and uh, she's talking about investing in nonprofits. 
uh, Social Entrepreneurs for a Sustainable Future. She is in very much the right person to talk about this stuff. She was a big deal before she ever hosted this show, but I was just given, I was given this memory by uh, Apple uh, it, the other day as we were arriving at the airport and Sherry Slate happened to walk up to me at the airport and we were talking about this and I'm like, there's so many good memories coming back as we're together at this show and creating memories here at Cisco Live, that's what we're all about. Uh, I believe Lauren is still my awesome, awesome co-host somewhere out on the show. Oh, I see yes, you have I'm someone very special with you, Lauren. Who might that be? I am so excited, Rob, to have Nicole Vallier back technical solutions architects of enterprise networking with me. I know we seem like we cut it short last time, right, Nicole? I told you we're coming back for you because we need to know how to play Capture the Flag. I know, I know, but you know what? Maybe I should talk faster. No, oh, it will be <laughs> fine. Capture the Flag. I mean, literally, I mean, we've been doing this for quite a while at Cisco Live, and it will be here physically, but also in a digital event. So if you're out there, definitely go and play it in the next couple of weeks. So what can you do so far? Here you can learn about all six Cisco technologies on enterprise networking, SD-WAN, SDA, um, Meraki, or if you're IoT, IoT, collaboration, WebEx calling, you know, name it security I mean we have die hard if you are into the sniffers and and really try to figuring out this is the game blue team blue team and red, the red team. team I saw that so I what's know. the difference between the red and the blue uh, so basically it's it's the good cop bad cop oh okay so it's a, it's a it's a security thing capture the flag probably maybe the people go like Nicole really capture <laughs> the flag what the heck is this I've never heard about it but you know what it's a sort of also a gamified game and I'll come back to you because it's from originally from the security industry so all the people in security they know well, very well about capture the flag and they are playing this but we've actually evolved this is in even to other technologies as well and so that's why it's so much fun for everybody to play this so it's you don't need to be security minded with it I love it I love it and it's actually one of my favorite games I, I love coming to Cisco live and getting competitive mm -hmm. I love trying to beat the next person like anytime oh, yeah. there's something about a competition I'm all game and that's that's the thing it's all about the competition you know gain points and even become that level one here because there are prizes here so you definitely should come if you are around um, really cool prizes. I saw Meraki has, has an awesome swag. Um, even the security. I mean, definitely could do come that. And you know what? If they find me, they even get the strobe waffle. Oh, we, we can't forget about this. We can't forget about that. No, exactly. No, a sugar rush. I mean, and that's the whole it, the capture the flag experiment as well, because it's all that getting the game in. Because you know what? That. We have been doing this for many years, and we have people that, that actually came here every day. So right now, so we're only on day two, so uh -huh. we, only, we already have like 400 people registered. Wow. And the previous Cisco Lives, we had like over 2,000 people playing this, and it, it's very addictive. What is the prize? Is it bragging rights or what? Uh, some of them is bragging rights because they want to show off on the on the screen, so they make selfies. So with with the leaderboard up here, so you can see already. So we are definite track. Oh, it just went over collaboration. And you can see that a couple of them, the green ones, they finished the mission, and some of them you can see they're very busy. So you can keep a live track as you speak as well, and to see, oh, I need to do better. So Meraki, people already completed the, the track as well. I see the different teams, the blue team, number one is Packahead. Packahead, you're out there, if you're listening, you are doing what you have to do. We are excited and rooting for you. Keep it up. <laughs> exactly, no, and that's why, and it's, it's, it's moving up. So the whole week till Thursday. Till Thursday, and speaking of which leaderboard, we have a very special participant out here in the audience who said, he is about to win. He said, watch out for him because he is going to take it all. Mr. Ken, how are you today? I'm doing great. How about yourself, Lauren? I am doing great. Are you enjoying Cisco Live? I'm loving it. You all in? Yes, sir. What's your all in? <laughs> sir, ma'am. Sorry. I'm Thank okay you. with it all, you know. <laughs> it's all good. I like, you I like it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And I also remember you saying this is your second Cisco it Live? It is my second Cisco Live. Second in person or? In person, yes. Awesome. So which, which technology have you been playing with today? Collaboration. Collaboration? Yes. I, I love it. You're all in. Are you are you the collab person at work? I, see, I am. I see the different accolades you have. You're an, a user group, inside user research. You have it all. Uh, not all, but <laughs> one day I will have it all. So. <laughs> <laughs> and Ken told me that his mom always told him he'd be on TV. So here we go. <laughs> here we go. 
Well, Kim, we are super excited to see you playing. Thank you, thank you. We want to see you on that leaderboard. We'll be checking in with you soon. Okay. Thank you for the all-in attitude. You got to give us some, some energy. Okay, we're, we're all right. We're going to head on out of here. Woo! Woo! We are all in at the Capture the Flag booth. If you have not already, register and play, because I'm going to play. Rob, you out there, are you going to play? Oh yeah, you no. Ready to, I've already you ready been to out go there. Put the gloves on. I've been out there playing, but I use <laughs> I use other names like Packethead. Oh, others. is that you? I'm not saying it's not. <laughs> I'm just saying that it's possible. And I, I, I see I see Julie must be on camera because she's always responding, even though we didn't ask for her input. Uh, let me ask you: Are you still near? Are you still near um, Stroopwafel? Are you still? I am. Nicole. Nicole. I've been asked I asked about her, how you. many does she have left? I want to know what how the count is. How many Stroop waffles do you have? And did I say that correctly? So Stroop waffles is actually Stroop waffles. And I just gave one away. I brought 288 Stroop, stroop waffles with me. Uh, I was very correct. I did declare them nicely and told them it's it's like a dessert. So and that I mean 288. And people were wondering why that magic number. They do come with boxes of 36. And uh, so everybody who's around here. Uh, I still have left, so definitely where, come Where is it? it? I gotta see it. I oh, yeah, it's next. Oh, you've already yeah, given I it out. I already gave it away. <laughs> so let me let, let me let me quickly show this again. <laughs> so here 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 is the stroopwafel, and it's your it's your really cookie, also known as a sugar rush. <laughs> so definitely, and Rob uh, the, probably will seeing this, and he's like, I want one, I want one. Rob Boyd is really a fan of these cookies. Well, well if you, you guys are not convinced. Yet, yeah, it's, it's not only just sweet to play the game, Capture the Flag, there's also some sweet treats over here. So make your way over to Capture the Flag online. It's going to be up there. That's awesome. Lauren, thank you so you, much. Rob, thank you so much. Studio. Thank you so much. Hey, you guys talking about security. Security begets visibility, or visibility begets better security. You cannot stop what you can't see. And one of the big things talked about with Liz and Tony in the keynote earlier this morning was this notion of full stack observability. And that is a common terminology. We've been growing and building on that here at Cisco, but they're continuing to invest in that area. And now it's not just about superior visibility, it's about predicting what's coming next. They're adding that into it. So let's take a look and get more details on that now. Good afternoon, welcome to today's innovation talk. Today we're gonna to talk about accelerating secure innovation. Specifically, we're gonna talk about one of the priorities that was outlined today on main stage, and that's full stack observability with a specific focus on modern applications. Everyone in here is part of the digital transformation. Cisco's aligned to supporting that, whether we're looking at adoption of a cloud experience, shifting to hybrid work, transitioning to the fastest wireless broadband possible. Everything we do is about using technology to provide business outcomes. But if you think about it, digital transformation is fundamentally an experience transformation. Arthur Clarke put it best, sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. As we go through the process of delivering a digital transformation, we are changing experiences, and we're changing experiences for people that matter to business. In fact, when you think about people, you can easily start to think about what your application touches, whether it's customers, revenue officers, investors, developers, financial professionals, you name it. And if those applications don't work, the experience suffers, and these folks are not productive. As a result of that, IT is no longer just in the business of making sure technology is there, but they're in the business of ensuring that the experience is optimized. And this is not just marching orders from a technologist's point of view, it's marching orders from the CEO. Fundamentally, experience optimization is a business imperative. So let's talk about the application for a moment. All of us are familiar with how incredible it is when an application works and how accessible applications are. You can grab them from an app store, load them on your phone. And a lot of us think, wow, that magic must be simple to deliver, especially in a cloud world. The folks in this room know that when you double click on that cloud, what's behind that is incredible complexity. Multiple hyperscalers, private clouds, edge clouds, SaaS services, all serving up an experience for an individual. 
And if anything goes wrong anywhere on that stack, the experience suffers. What we often don't think about is the user experience is a culmination of web services, compute, storage, networking, infrastructure, application logic. Any issue is amplified, and any issue is an aggregation to the experience. However, in today's multi-cloud environment, that problem is a lot worse. Across all the hyperscalers, across private cloud, across edge cloud, any issue that might exist anywhere on that stack, especially in a heterogeneous world where it's all different, creates a major issue. Now today, we have to be workflow investigators. We have to identify where the issue is to solve that issue. And as you look across that architecture, you have to realize there are different people who speak different languages and have different priorities, whether they're DevOps, NetOps, InfraOps, SecOps, the line of business, and of course, developers. It makes matters worse that each and every point in the silo, every point in your architecture may have a different team. And some of those team members may be part of SaaS organizations that are more black box in nature. So how do you deal with this? What's the role of observability? Well, today's pros are turning to point tools. They'll get a point tool for cloud native. They'll get a point tool for security. They'll get a point tool for networking, and they'll try to stitch it together. But reality is that's very inefficient. And what we're seeing in the industry is a drive towards a new category of technology, an integrated, unified approach, a new category of observability. And that's called full stack observability. What is full stack observability? Well, put it simply, it's about delivering experience optimization. Experience optimization is about building on top of monitoring, going beyond observability, but giving you business context and impact with real-time distributed and hybrid applications. It's about delivering visibility, insights. Cisco's full stack observability solution combines app dynamics, thousand eyes, intersight, with our own unique intellectual property that's native Cisco to deliver great capabilities. It takes application observability, infrastructure observability, security observability with unified data to help you ensure you understand what's happening. And we tie this to business context, which means you can always understand what the impact of an issue really is. Business context is the magic part. When an application is having trouble, what does it mean to the line of business? Does it mean that you're not able to book orders? Or does it mean you aren't able to deliver hospital services when you need them? The use cases our customers tell us they're looking to full stack observability for can be easily organized into the following three categories, performance, optimization, and security. On performance, it's about monitoring, hybrid application monitoring, modern cloud native application monitoring, customer digital experience monitoring, and of course, dependency monitoring. On optimization, this is all about cost, ensuring that your hybrid costs are appropriate and your resources are optimized. And of course, on security, it's about API to API or API to data security, the integral components of application security and getting that visibility and insights in action across an entire architecture. This is super valuable, but there's a side benefit from this. And that's to ensure that you're delivering multi-cloud economics, making the right decisions at the right time, at the right cost level. Now, this is important to understand, but what's also important to understand is the need to have that end-to-end -end visibility is not optional. What you see on the screen is a typical menu of an IT stack looking at it from the lens of applications. Organizations have applications that sit in their data center or traditional in nature. Organizations take those applications in many circumstances and migrate them as is to the public cloud. We call that lift and shift. We have organizations that are building new applications, leveraging Kubernetes and services. And more importantly, we're seeing organizations bring it all together, having a composite approach to application logic that brings together public cloud, private cloud, edge cloud into one seamless end-to-end -end experience. We see it in healthcare. We see it in digital applications. We're super excited about where that potential can take us. Full stack observability is about having one approach and meeting your customers where they need to be through your application strategy to ensure that you're delivering that value. For the next portion of our presentation, I'm super excited to introduce Sundar. Sundar is gonna walk you through the announcements and the capabilities on the application observability side. Sundar. Hello, everyone. 
I'm super excited to be here, and thanks for joining us. As Matt mentioned, he talked to you about the key use cases for full stack observability. For the next few minutes, I'm going to talk, and then I'm also going to show you a demo of traditional application monitoring, but also expand into cloud-native modern application mon uh, observability. So let's start with the capabilities that we have in the market today. Right? Today, users of AppDynamics and Thousand Eyes get a view of the end user impact and be able to correlate that all the way back to the application observability on the server side. Last year, we launched a series of integrations with Secure App, and with that, you've got an integrated viewpoint for DevOps and SecOps of performance problems which could have security implications too. Today, you all heard at the keynote, Liz and Tony introduce AppDynamics Cloud. This is our new offering for modern cloud-native application observability. So what problems are we trying to solve? Right. Today, with cloud-native modern observability, the problem is most of the solutions, whether it's open source or proprietary vendor, were started off was one use case, and various other use cases were bolted on over a span of time. This results in disconnected data silos, incomplete visibility, and a biased point of view, which means you have a different view from a logs perspective, you have a different view from a metrics perspective, you have a different view from traces. This causes a real problem where we as users have to literally have a swivel chair, right, where you're looking from tool to tool to tool in order to solve the problem. That's literally the problem we are trying to solve with AppDynamics Cloud. The goal for this, as we thought about it, was to build a ground up new observability product which is focused on cloud native observability. And as we thought about it, there were four key pillars or design principles that we adopted. First one, as I mentioned, is the ability for users to be able to see up and down their stack, all the way from business, down into applications and services, down into infrastructure, and network storage and compute. So that required a data model for cross-domain insights. So that was pillar number one. Second one is this idea that traditionally, this industry has been very oriented towards proprietary technologies. We as an industry have moved towards open standards. So open telemetry compliant platform and APIs became a no-brainer. Third one, we are observing cloud scale applications. Obviously you need a cloud scale platform, but you need a cloud scale platform that's extensible so that not only do we offer solutions on top, you as customers are able to build solutions on top and partners are able to build second and third party solutions on top. And last one, but not the least, traditionally AppDynamics has been really, really, really strong about helping users troubleshoot in context of business. They've done this through concepts of business transactions, business outcomes, and domain-assisted AI. We continue to build on those and add that to cloud-native observability. So as we thought about it, as for even for our first release that's happening at the end of this month, three key nuggets of value that we're delivering that we will build on release after release. First one is to really get rid of that swivel chair phenomenon. How do we enable cross-domain insights for users of various different persona? Second, how do we ensure that we do not offer a biased point of view? We are able to derive insights from metrics, events, logs, traces, and bring them all together in order to make up RCA faster. And lastly, of course, AI has been something that we as an industry have been working on for a while, it's not a silver bullet. What we are discovering is AI-assisted human experiences really help reduce MTTR and MTTD. That's really the focus. Now, I talked a bunch about it. It's always fun to actually show the product. So let's see a demo. So let me contextualize the demo a little bit for you. Yeah, the background is, this is the, the demo of an Acme Corp, which is a modern cloud-native application where they have launched their services, instrumented in open telemetry on AWS using EKS to manage Kubernetes service. The marketing department is complaining that there has been some issues on ad displays, and they've come to the DevOps person, Aparna, and said, hey, you need to fix this yesterday because this is having an impact on the IRR. So what does Aparna need to do? She needs to jump into AppD Cloud, and this is the home screen that she starts seeing. The first view itself, as you can see, a few things. She gets an entire bird's eye view of her overall infrastructure, right? She gets a view of the actual services, the underlying Kubernetes concepts, as well as the infrastructure view. And she gets a clue to the health status just based on this. She notices that there is a problem with the service, so she double clicks to investigate more of what's happening there. Right? 
she discovers a couple of things, right? The left side view gives her a view all the way from the business transaction, which is the business entity, down into the services, and down, down into the Kubernetes concepts and infrastructure. She notices that there is an issue with the workload as well as the service. So that's her first clue. The second clue, she notices that the average response time for the service instance has peaked at the same time that the system has provided AI anomalies. So she wants to dig deeper, and let's see what she does. She digs deeper and starts looking at the view of the metrics, logs, and events for each of these. As she expands the health violations, she notices that there is a pod status issue. She looks at logs, the logs look okay, but she looks at some of the events and she realizes that there is an issue with both warning and some abnormal events. So she wants to dig a little bit deeper, right? She figures out that there is also a pod status issue and she wants to go deeper and she notices that there is a back off event. So that's the first clue. Pods are failing, there is a back off event, and that's what is causing some of the issues. Right? Now, she has to go figure out the actual root cause of why these pods are failing and what needs to be corrected in order to do this. Right? So she starts taking the next step. Right? She starts looking at the underlying metrics correlated data, and what she notices is the memory limit. As you all can notice, the memory limit has spanned more than 100% multiple times, and it's correlated in time with, the, with where she is seeing drop-offs in average response time. That gives her the clue of how to fix this, right? So if you think about it, within a few clicks, she's been able to get an aggregated view instead of having to go from one tool to another in order to find out the source of truth from metrics or logs or events or traces. It's all in there, and more importantly, she's able to go up and down the stack to figure out what the problem is. So she goes ahead, talks to her dev team, realizes there was a, a release that happened where this config value had changed. She asks them to revert the change, brings the website back, and goodness, right? We are back to Green's health status. She's able to go back to the marketing department and say all's well for now. And then she'll continue with the developer team, figure out what changes need to be happening in the code for the long term. Right? Now, what we just saw was a change, right? This is different from what we have seen before. Instead of going from various different point tools, taking a look at one single screen and being able to solve is a big deal. That's the power of AppD Cloud. With that, let me just quickly recap. We talked about the value of traditional application monitoring that we've always done, and the ability to add modern cloud-native applications and be able to see that end-to-end -end view from our perspective. All right, it's great for me to talk to you about this. It's even better to hear from a customer about this. For that, let's roll the video. What is great? Great is not confined to gold medals and gridiron glory. It's an attitude, state of mind. Great is dedication, discipline, innovation. Great is a million little things that add up to something bigger. Over 125 JD Power dealers of excellence, a half million five-star reviews, the most anywhere, and driving towards 35 million ways to fight cancer through drive fit. That's what great means at AutoNation. Delivering the best customer experience as we buy, sell, and service the most iconic automotive brands anywhere. Because what drives you drives us to go be great. Good afternoon, my name is Adam Rausner, I'm Vice President of Technology Operations at AutoNation, and I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about our three-year journey towards modernizing the sales and service process at AutoNation, and how full stack observability has been key to our success in this effort. But first, let me tell you a little bit about our company. AutoNation is the largest automotive retail in the country. We're 350 locations in 19 states. We have 22,000 associates, and we in, are in multiple lines of business, from new car dealerships, we have our all pre-owned, which we call AutoNation USA. We run a precision parts business and parts distribution business, a collision, and obviously we service every car that we make. Um, we're also really proud to be JD Power's most honored dealership group, and we're very passionate about our Drive Pink initiative. We've raised over $35 million in 20 years towards Drive Pink, and Matt's gonna tell you how you can help me drive out cancer at the end of the presentation. 
So let's be honest with each other. Uh, the cars have continued to innovate over the years, but the process really hasn't. It's a slow process. It's very manual and paper driven. A uh, lot of disparate legacy systems that, you know, we spend just too much time in the dealership. It's 2022 now. There's got to be a better way. So AutoNation is driving towards a new digital experience. And I'm going to spend a few minutes today talking about some industry first, some AutoNation industry first that we've developed that we're really excited about. And I'll tell you how full stack observability plays into that. So AutoNation.com is our e-commerce platform. It allows our customers to go online and do about 90% of the transaction right there. You can pick out your car. You can look at competitive pricing. You can do your financing. Uh, you can pick out your extras, everything you want to do up until about 90% of the way. And that last 10%, you can come into the store uh, or we can bring the car to your driveway with our store-to-door -door initiative and you sign in an iPad. There's different generations of people in this room and they want to buy cars different ways. I'm old school. I want to go in. I want to kick the tires and drive the cars. There's people in this room that want to buy a car like they buy a car on Amazon and we want to accommodate all those different scenarios. On our service side, we're really excited about our customer engagement platform. It's an application we've developed so that the service advisors and service techs can actually take videos of your car while they're up on the rack, and they can show you that cracked exhaust or the condition of your tires or that transmission issue, because traditionally, customers don't feel good about repairs at dealerships. They want to see it, and seeing is believing. So it's been a really powerful tool for us in our service area, and it also allows you to schedule your loaner, approve the repairs, talk back and forth with the technician, and it's an industry first for us that we're very, very proud of. Back to the sales side. Uh, using 20 years of appraisal and sales data, we've developed a tool called the Equity Mining Tool, where you come in, you maybe you're out of warranty, you've got some time left on your five-year car note, and you've been presented with a $6,000 transmission issue. Um, our sales team is notified. The tool automatically calculates the equity in your car, and we approach you and say, hey, would you like to leave today with a brand new car, same payment, avoid this costly repair, uh, and 1,500 customers a month are saying yes. And what's really powerful about that is that's, that's data that we've had since the beginning of time, just using it in a different way. So we're really proud of that innovation, and it's really helped our sales team. Also on the service side, We've introduced it VR goggles with some of our partners like uh, BMW and Porsche. So if our technicians run into an issue and they can't diagnose it at the store, they can get online with California or even Europe, and the technicians overseas can see in real time what they're doing and help them tell them where they need to make an adjustment. Uh, they can see what the technician's seeing, and it's been a really, really powerful tool and an automation industry first that we're very proud of. On the uh, purchase of cars, uh, if you've ever been through that process, it's come sometimes lengthy, it takes a long time to get your money, especially if you're not trading towards a new car. Our Will Buy Your Car initiative, you bring your car in under an hour, we assess and appraise the car, and you leave there within the hour with either a paper check or we sell the money to your account. No one else is doing that today. Uh, we're very proud of that. So, as you can imagine, lots of different business units. I named them all. There's six or seven very big business units in our company. Lots of different applications. We have on-prem data centers, Colorado, Texas, all over the country. We have a big presence in both AWS and Azure. And we have a heavy reliance on third-party software as a service in the automotive industry. And all these things have to talk to each other. And in a world where you're introducing new technology to old business processes, it's critical that you understand what's going on. They're very nervous to begin with. And so you've got to deploy apps that are scalable, that are reliable, that people understand uh, issues before they happen so we don't have any business impacting outages. So we've been working very, very hard towards that. So the payoff. Well, the payoff is using tools like AppDynamics, we've been able to set some baseline performance metrics. And when we see performance waver above or below that baseline, we're able to get ahead of the issues before they become business impacting, whether it's performance or complete outage. Uh, we've been able to reduce our severity when outages in the last three years by 90%. It's a statistic I'm extremely proud of. And then using tools like Thousand Eyes, we're able to not only see our user experience for our own applications, but we're, in, we're deploying that on our SaaS applications as well, third-party applications. So we're going back to our vendors and saying, here's these calls that are slow, this is loading incorrectly, 
and they're actually able to make those adjustments. Theoretically, it should be their problem, but we're taking it on because it's so critical to our business. So in the end, we wind up with proactive alerting. We've maximized our uptime. We have visibility across our own apps and our third-party apps for user experience. And probably the biggest and most important thing is that the business trusts us when we go to deploy new features and services. Uh, they're not nervous that we're going to put something out that's not going to work well in front of the customer or going to give the customer a very poor experience. Uh, and, and it's one of the most, the biggest things that we've really gained out of this whole thing is that the business is really excited about the innovations that we're bringing. So what's next for AutoNation? Well, first, full stack observability is going to remain to be part of our DNA. We've got everybody on board, all the way from the infrastructure team to DevOps to the database team to the developers who are actually coding. Uh, they're putting in code that can be measured by thousand eyes to see what user experience looks like. We're also going to continue to push out new innovations in the automotive industry that we're really, really excited about. And very, very important, especially when you're moving quickly in time to market, is security. And so we don't want to put out applications that put both company data or customer data at risk. So we're piloting a secure app platform on AppDynamics, and we're really excited about what that's going to offer us. That's my time. I've put my contact information up here. I'd love to have a conversation with anybody that's interested. Um, thank you very much. Back to Matt. All right. Listening to a customer transforming an entire industry is such a privilege. Adam, thank you so much for that story. I'd like to go ahead and invite some speakers up to have a quick panel discussion of the value that we're seeing and the directions we're taking for full stack observability. I'd like to introduce Joe Vaccaro, head of products at Thousand Eyes. Sunder, head of products at AppDynamics. Come join us, guys. Welcome. Okay, so we talked a lot about full stack observability. I did want to talk a little bit about the network transformation that we're all seeing, the internet becoming that core component of the network and what that means from a variety of different perspectives. So Joe, can you talk a little bit about what customers are doing with regards to observability and what Cisco's doing to ensure we have the right solutions on that front? Sure, you know, thanks Matt. You know, as Adam just shared, you know, digital experiences are more important than ever before, but teams are dealing with less control than they've ever had in their lifetimes. So at Thousand Eyes, what we're really focused on is how do we provide a common operational language so that teams can be able to see and understand every digital experience they rely upon and be able to ensure that great experience for their users. Now, what does that mean in practicality, right? We talk about with Adam that cloud has become their new data center, that internet's become their new network, that SaaS applications become their new application stack. So with Thousand Eyes, the ability to actually take an application metric such as your page load response time be able to then trace that through the underlying network to be able to identify that the increase in response time is due to an ISP that my users are being able or that are accessing from a particular location. To be able to then accelerate that mean time to remediation and localization so that you can be able to resolve that problem. You know, that's some of that innovation, the cross-layer correlation that we provide, the ability to then visualize that uh, data seamlessly inside of Thousand Eyes, to then create the level of actions across that stack to be able to work together as a team. Not so that the application team can be able to solve a network problem, but the application team can then work in harmony with the network team to be able to resolve that and get that digital experience back on uh, proper footing. It makes a lot of sense. With, with the network being extended to the open internet, there's always a lot of security concerns. Adam, can you talk a little bit about the security vector from your future plans? Yeah, I mean, security is, is where a few years ago was kind of a secondary thought. Now it's first in everything. So you know, we have a dedicated net, uh, network team, and we also have a dedicated security team that have to work very closely to make sure that as we're deploying these applications, all the PI data and customer data is secure. Um, and we're hoping that Secure App may help us with that. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. When moving to new architecture, especially with cloud natives, under, this is another important area that organizations are incorporating in. Can you talk a little bit about the advances we've made there and how it could help, given the context we just said? Yeah. If you hear everything that we just said in this talk, and if you hear other talks during this conference, one thing that you would kind of repeatedly hear is the ability for different parts of the organization to have a common language 
to have a common view in order to solve the problem. In some ways, full stack observability, cloud native and otherwise, is effectively that. If people can have a common language and have a common view, then the ability to root cause and reach an answer really, really quickly becomes very, very simple. And that's what each of us are in some ways talking about from various different points of view. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for the panel discussion. Thanks everyone for joining. I do want to leave you with one call to action. We are participating in the Drive Pink initiative with AutoNation. And Cisco is matching donations dollar for dollar for this really critical cancer fighting initiative. We'd like to encourage you to participate in this. You can visit the App Dynamics booth to make a donation and a commitment, and Cisco will match all of that dollar for dollar. I'd like to thank you so much for your time. Thank our presenters. We hope you enjoy the rest of Cisco Live 2022. All right, so that was full stack observability, a couple of different very special people speaking there. I just want to give a shout out. I don't know if you'll hear this or not, but Adam Rasner there from AutoNation, he helped me get my Audi before I gave it back up for my Ford truck, just so you know the relationship there. But Adam is a wonderful guy, AutoNation. He's doing some incredible things with Cisco technologies and other technologies as they look to really blow away their customers with support, unique services, and reasons to go to a dealership and interact with these people that we haven't always had. Um, Alex, 30 seconds, just curious, what has been a big focus for you here? It's your first one, mm -hmm. what stood out to you? Uh, the two main things that stood out to me was definitely the hybrid work environment, going from the home to the office to working from anywhere, that's a big one for me, and the yeah. fact that when you go to the office that you can see the full visibility of all the available spaces, using Cisco DNA spaces, as well as sustainability. All yeah. the ways that we can give back at this event, that we can make an impact to local communities. So, yeah, those would be yeah, the biggest perfect. thing for me. I like that, and that's just, boy, there's so many layers to what you have there. Guys, we've got our, I think it's our last iTalk of the day, we're going to throw to that now. As I tease, it's Sherry Slate, investing in nonprofits and social entrepreneurs, right? Now, let's take a look over at the iTalk. Oh, it is so good to see you. Welcome to Cisco Live. It is so lovely to be back in Vegas. Um, thank you all for joining this session. As we kick off, let me ground you in the why we're going to have this discussion. All of our companies are in service of something bigger, a bigger purpose, a bigger mission. It's never been more important than it is today as all of our companies are working to reach the heightened expectations of our stakeholders. Stakeholders who are asking us to do more. They're asking us to solve the world's biggest social, economic, and environmental challenges. What we know is that that is not only a very big opportunity, but there are people in this world who are doing it every day. This session, we are going to shine a light on a social entrepreneur who is leveraging the power of technology to do exactly that, solve the world's biggest challenges, what we hope is that in this conversation, you will see how the power of technology can help companies like Cisco deliver on the promise of our purpose. What we hope is that you leave with three things. The first is that you see how one person leveraging the power of technology can deliver big outcomes, and in this case, it's school hunger. The second is that you'll join us. You'll join us in taking one small action in service of a very big solution. And the third, the third is that you will see bigger and wider around how you as a technologist or a leader in technology can help your company solve for how it's going to deliver on the promise of its purpose. Just like the social entrepreneur that I'm about to introduce you to, Cisco's founders always believed in the power of technology and that it could positively impact the world. Well, you might remember our early days, we were in service of change. We were changing the way the world lived, worked, played, and learned as we built the networks that shaped the internet that you know today. Well, we believe that when we apply technology in a responsible and thoughtful way, that we can positively impact people, planet, and society. So we're building on our history. And today, Cisco's purpose is to power an inclusive future for all. And what we know is with 
a purpose of that magnitude, we can't do it alone. It's the reason why we're partnering with nonprofits and social enterprises to ensure that we have scale and reach around the globe. It is also why we are funding innovation challenges, innovation challenges that are supporting social entrepreneurs who are solving the world's biggest challenges in new and different ways. But here's what's so important about them. They are accelerants to impact. They are driving impact at accelerated rates, but the most important thing is they are making it relevant at the local, regional, and global level. One of our examples of how we're doing this is seen in our partnership with Global Citizen. Global Citizen is a social action platform in service of ending extreme world poverty by 2030. Cisco partnered with them in 2018. We committed a million dollars over four years and together we created the Global Citizen Prize Cisco Youth Leader Award. Well, what I can tell you is that award recognizes people who are age 18 to 30 who are positively impacting the world. And today, you're in the right place because we have a special treat. The first ever recipient of that award is here with us at Cisco Live. But before I introduce you to her, I want to tell you a little bit about her. You see, she is the founder and executive director of Food for Education, which is a social enterprise that leverages the power of partnership between government, community, and parents to scale national school feeding programs. She is a highly decorated leader. She is the youngest recipient of the South Australian Alumni Award in 2017. In 2018, she became a Rainier Arnold Fellow. In that same year, she earned the Builders of Africa Award, and she was also named a top 40 under 40 woman of Kenya. In 2020, she became a Ford Foundation Global Fellow. In 2021, she became a World Economic Forum Global Young Leader. And most recently, the United Nations named her the 2021 Kenya Person of the Year. Please help me bring to the stage with a very warm and enthusiastic welcome to the amazing Wawira Injiru. Hello, my friend. Hello. It's so good to see you here at Cisco Live, and thank you to all of them. Hi, this is what we call a, a very warm Cisco Live welcome. Come join me, let's take a seat. Thank you, I'm so excited to be here. It's my first time in Vegas. Oh, first time in Vegas and at Cisco Live? First time at Cisco Live, too. Okay, you should buy a lotto ticket. That's a, <laughs> <laughs> it's a winning combination. I know. I'm so happy to be here. Hi, everyone. So, while we're at, it's great to have you here. And maybe we start at the beginning. Take us back to, back to 2018, the beginning of your relationship with Cisco. Um, you were at the Global Citizen event, Cisco, Chuck Robbins, our CEO, Usher, they presented you with the Global Citizen Prize Cisco Youth Leader Award. You got to take that stage with millions of people watching and you got to share your vision for impact. What was that like? I mean, Shari, it was one of the most incredible moments of my life. Um, I never stood in front of that many people ever um, and you know getting to share the stage with so many incredible artists and activists to be in South Africa celebra celebrating Mandela um, and getting to meet Chuck for the first time the CEO of Cisco was so incredible for me and I'd have to say meeting Asha was okay it was kind of cool too <laughs> <laughs> yeah Ch Chuck is Chuck is cool as well um, so <laughs> the prize was two hundred fifty thousand dollars how did you use the money to accelerate food for education? So $250,000 was such a big gift to food for education. And it came to us at a time of you know, very significant growth and we were feeding then around 3,000 children every single day. And with that $250,000, we were able to accelerate to around 10,000 children every single day. But on top of that, we were able to introduce technology to our work. So initially, parents contribute for meals in, for the meals that we provide. They used to uh, contribute cash, which was very heavy, you know, in terms of like 
collecting that many coins because it's 15 cents, it's coins. And so we developed this technology called Tap to Eat, which is essentially you know, a near field communication bracelet, an NFC bracelet exactly like this ones we're wearing and the, <laughs> and the kids wear to school. And when they come to school, it's topped up with uh, an e-wallet using mobile money, which is very common in Kenya, uh, which you know most people in the US would be using credit cards or debit cards. But we use the technology of NFC to create essentially a lunch ATM where kids are able to just tap and get lunch and their parents have topped up on the mobile wallet. So I have to say that is a very powerful use of technology, using it in new and different ways. Let's talk about food for education for a minute. Um, you, let's see, you started food for education when you were 21. Mm -hmm. You often talk about your audacious mission, but before I go there, we often talk about Wawira and food for education as a proof point for how companies like Cisco are gonna deliver on the promise of their purpose. You are absolutely helping us create a pathway for for creating a positive and powerful future for all. You often say that you're on an audacious mission to eradicate classroom hunger. So let's take the audience through your mission, why you started Food for Education, and then what problem you're solving for Africa. Yeah, so I started Food for Education, as you said, when I was 21 years old. I was a university student, you know, I went to Australia in, uh, for my undergrad. Um, and it's very far from Kenya, which is where I'd grown up uh, from, but I was 18 and I wanted to work my way through uni and Australia offered me that opportunity to do that and to pay my school fees as well. So while I was studying there, um, I started Food for Education because I wanted to give back to the community that I grew up in. And it was a very small feeding program for just 25 children, uh, providing them with lunch every day. I did a small fundraiser, cooked, you know, not great food, I'll admit, it wasn't, I'm not the best cook. And it was a Kenyan dinner and everyone in Australia, in the community I lived in was so excited about this Kenyan dinner that was, you know, it wasn't representation of what Kenyan food is. I'm sure it was delicious. <laughs> it I, was I not, <laughs> it was not delicious, but people gave me $20 to come to the dinner. And with that, we raised $1,250. Uh, and these are the first 25 children that we started feeding. And I really strongly you know, believe in the power of an individual to be able to create change. And I wanted to do my part you know, as I was studying a degree in nutrition, learning about the power of nutrition, and ensuring that kids have access to the right nutrition is something that I have become and was very passionate about. Quick question for you. You said you started with 25 kids. How many are you feeding today? 40,000. Okay, yeah. So I think for everybody sitting here, when you think about you know, what does impact look like, and it, it looks like going from 25,000, 25 kids to 40,000 kids. I'm gonna ask you while we wrote what everyone I think in this room is thinking, going from 25 to 40,000, What's happening behind the scenes that allows you to feed 40,000 kids a day? Yeah, so as I said, I'm not a great cook. So first of all, getting the best team to be able to prepare the meals is so important to how we're able to deliver meals every single day. So, you know, the women, a lot of, 70% of the people who work in our kitchens are women. Uh, and they wake up really early. In some kitchens, they're running 24 hour kitchens. Uh, and some of them are, as you can see, um, waking up really early, coming to work to ensure that kids have access to meals. So there's a lot of prep work and a lot of cooking that's happening overnight. So that by around six or 7 a.m., all the food is ready and ready to go out to schools. So we load the food up in, um, you know, this kind of vessels that keep the food hot so that we ensure that the food gets to the kids at a safe temperature and, you know, it's healthy for them to eat. And we ensure that, you know, there's the right balance of protein, vegetables, to ensure that kids are getting the right nutrition that they need. So once we load up the food in these containers, we put them in a truck. So we have a fleet of trucks that distribute across our five central kitchens right now. 
um, and we distribute the, the food in the trucks to the schools that are served. And when we get to the schools, you know, my favorite time is when the bell rings, kids run out of classrooms, their lunch boxes, and it's time to tap to eat, and they tap and they get access to the meals uh, that, you know, they really, really treasure and they want to come to school and have. Oh my gosh, there is a picture of a young person enjoying their lunch, this picture right here. I mean, when you look at that picture and you think about what it means to have a warm meal so that you can study, that is inspiration. Mm -hmm. So very complex network to feed 40,000 kids a day. Congratulations to you and your team for thinking about the scale and the ability to repeat this over and over and over again. But clearly, purpose runs deep for you. So my question is around inspiration. How do you inspire everyone from the farmers through to the government, the children, their parents, the school district? How do you inspire everyone to go on this journey with you for the long term? Yeah, that's a really good question because I think that my genesis in this journey of food for education was just bringing people along and trying to find ways that people can be involved in what I was, you know, what I believe in. And from the fundraising dinner that I spoke about where, you know, I cooked really not great food, but people still gave $20. It was really, it's always been really important for me to inspire people, to be able to think that they too can, and believe that they too can change uh, the lives of someone else. So from the government, from different, um, you know, organizations, from different stakeholders, parents, teachers, it's really a journey of showing them how kids, I think kids are some of the most awesome uh, people, you know, it's the best stage to be in, and to show them the promise and, and to show them how kids have so much potential and how a simple thing like providing them with a meal is really, really important to ensure that they're able to stay in school and learn. So I'm gonna tell you something. In, at Cisco, we often talk about our superpower. So yours might not be cooking, but you <laughs> absolutely have inspired a ton of people. Let's, let's talk about Kenya and mm. hunger in Kenya for a minute. It's been a longstanding challenge. Mm. And I can only imagine that the pandemic exacerbated this challenge. What did you have to do with your business model, with your operations to be able to continue to feed these children? Yeah, so I mean, the pandemic was challenging for everyone across the world, for you know, systems across the world. I was attending a session this morning that was talking about the pandemic in the U.S. and how that affected schools. And in Kenya, you know, a lot of kids were relying on the meals that we provide as the only meal or the most nutritious meal they get in a day. And when schools were shut down in March 2020, it really led us to you know, have to reinvent how we distribute meals because we knew we had to do something. We couldn't just go home and say, you know, we're gonna sit at home until this is finished because there was no end in sight for the pandemic. And so we thought about how do we continue providing meals to kids and their families when they're home? And we created distribution centers close to their homes because schools were shut down and we couldn't distribute through schools. And we also created packages of food where it was dry food that they could pack up and you know, go home with and prepare at home. And that would enable them and their families to have access to meals. Uh, during that time, we provided over 200 tons of food to over 25,000 families and also provided um, you know, meals that are equivalent of 2 million meals during that time, which is something that our team did a huge effort in terms of distribution and making sure that kids were able to have access to meals. They always say that great leaders always see a new path when there's a new challenge and uh, you and your team should be commended for continuing to feed all those families. I, I can only imagine that your journey, Wawira, has been filled with ups and downs. Um, when you think about your lessons learned, what lessons have you learned that you apply to Food for Education today? Yeah, I mean, my journey has definitely been full of a lot of ups and downs. And I think one of the things that I'd, I'd, I'd say as one of my key lessons, I have a couple, is the power of technology. And I think all of us are here because technology is so powerful. You know, when we developed Tap to Eat, feeding around 3,000 kids and have been able to accelerate to around 40,000 kids is because we have a seamless way of participating with parents for them to 
uh, to be able to feed their children. And so technology has been really powerful in helping us uh, operationalize and helping us scale. The second lesson is around the, um, you know, the power of technology, so the power of technology and then also around the power of a team. So I'm very lucky to have a great team around me that enable me to be able to uh, do the work that I do. And that's something I've also learned a lot from, you know, being involved with the Cisco team, watching Chuck and Fran, who I'm lucky to call friends and advisors, showing how the te teams are so important to be help deliver the way Cisco does is the same way that Food for Education is really leaning into our team to be able to provide the meals that we provide every single day. And the third lesson is that scale brings its own challenges. So we've scaled massively across Kenya over the last couple of years. And you know, we've gone to places that we didn't expect, know how to distribute food to entirely. And we've had to learn you know, when you're building a plane while you're flying it. So we've had to learn you know, in new areas how to do distribution, how to provide, to source in areas that maybe don't grow the food locally, and how to create supply chains in such areas. Um, and the fourth lesson is that no effort is too small. Mm -hmm. I really believe that every person can do something meaningful in the world to contribute to the world. And that is one of the lessons that I've learned from 25 children um, and you know, making an impact for them. For example, you know, the, the, the wonderful man on the screen, his name is Jackson. And he's one of the 25 kids that we started feeding um, when I was 21 years old. <laughs> and Jackson's, you know, he's now no longer a young boy. Uh, he's a young man and he, you know, tells a story about having 20 cents on some days that he would use to buy lunch, but in most days going hungry. And when Food for Education came to his school, he says that he was able to lift his hand in class because he was, you know, he'd had lunch. He had the energy to be able to answer a question. And because of that, he was able to finish his primary school, went to high school as the first person in his family to go to high school and complete high school, and then went to college. And now, so proud that he works at Food for Education, making sure that other kids are able to access meals. Oh, while we were at Jackson's story, and the first time I heard it, you all, I, I did cry. It, every time I hear his story, it gives me chills. Me too. Having the strength to be able to raise his hand in class because of what you and the organization have been able to provide to him and so many other children. When I think about leaders like you, Wawira, I, I call you a serial impact maker, which means you dream big and you don't stop dreaming. There's always something else. So I'm gonna ask you what's next? So that's a really good question. Um, you know, when we're thinking about our scale, as I've said, that we were feeding 3,000 kids a day just a f when we won the Cisco Prize. Now we're feeding 40,000 kids a day. Our goal this year is to reach 100,000 um, kids by the end of June 2023. We are also looking at, you know, building Africa's largest kitchen, which is something that will enable us to feed more children with better technology. And that's something that we're working on right now. We have five kitchens right now in three counties and are looking at building a very high capacity, high technology powered kitchen and looking at replicating that to reach our goal um, and to ensure that we feed, you know, how many, 100,000 kids by June, 2023. And our five year goal is a million kids in, um, in the next five years. So school feeding, you know, has great returns and has been able to provide a lot. And so our goal to feed a million kids every day is to ensure that more kids have access to the same returns and the same impact that school meals have for kids and for all of us. Okay, Jackson's story gave me chills. So it is feeding a million kids a day. So you went from 25 to 40, you're ramping to 100,000, and now your big audacious goal is 1 million? Is 1 million and to build Africa's largest kitchen. So when you think about what it's going to take to build one or feed one million kids and build Africa's largest kitchen, what do you need? So, I mean, building, you know, the infrastructure to be able to, to distribute as many meals, 
resourcing is one of the key challenges that we have in terms of how money to be able to distribute the meals, to be able to cook the meals, to build the high capacity kitchens, uh, and also the building of technology. So as you have said, that technology is such a big component of what we do and what we all do, I think, in this room. So that's something that we're thinking a lot about. How do we build, have the resources, first of all, to scale our work, and then have the right technology to continue growing what we're doing to ensure that kids have access to meals? Wow. Wow, we around. I have to share with you that Cisco is so inspired by all that you have done. I think at the beginning of this conversation, everyone I said you were in for a treat. Um, one part that you get to meet this extraordinary leader. The other is um, while we were at Cisco is all in. We are going to be donating five hundred thousand dollars to Food for Education. <laughs> Congratulations. So here's what I would love. Is it okay for me to share with everyone? Here's what we're doing together. Cisco will be donating $500,000 to Food for Education in support of the construction of your kitchens and the food feeding programs. But it's going to come in two pieces. One part is a twenty-five or $250,000 in a cash grant. The other, this is Cisco Live, right, is coming in the form of technology security, collaboration, networking technology, the services to ensure that Food for Education's IT infrastructure can scale to meet the need for the 100 million, or oh, 100 million kids. One. Did I say 100 million? <laughs> 100 million. <laughs> That's I've already upped it. Uh, one million, feeding 1 million children a day. Cool. So congratulations. And thank, thank you, all of you, for, for being able to be part of this announcement. Oh, thank you so much. Oh. Yeah. Thank you so much, and thank you, Cisco. Wow. I know that 500,000 is, is a lot. This is just the beginning. It's a seed to doing something incredible together. But Wawira, if those of us that are sitting in the audience want to be a part of the journey for the long haul, how is it that we can get involved? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I am so thankful. This is incredible. Um, I said it's my first time in Vegas. I didn't know that my first time in Vegas would be so memorable and so incredible. So thank you, Cisco, and thank you, uh, Shari and Chuck and Fran and everyone on the team for making this happen. I am so, so grateful. And the Food for Education team is so grateful because this will mean so much to so many children. If you would like to get involved and support our work, uh, there's our website, www.food, the number four, education. Dot org. There's also a QR code that you can scan and donate. And, you know, we're, we're just like really, really grateful to be here and very, when we started with 25 children, I never knew that I would be here. So I feel just so much gratitude. Thank you. Well, Warira, you are an inspiration. Thank you for all that you've done. I have to tell you, yes, Cisco is all in, but I think you now have everyone in this audience and everyone out there watching who can be a part of this journey. Hopefully we will have you come back to a Cisco Live in the future and tell us about the progress of Food for Education. I would love that. Thank you so much. Absolutely. To all of you, thank you so much for being here today to be a part of what we call how inspiration is currency, how we create a recurring impact for people. This is how we how we power an inclusive future together. So thank you for joining us, and I hope you have a fabulous Cisco Live.
Korea be the match. It was simple, just swab your mouth and send it in. Be the Match is a global database of donors. To save more lives, they needed to make more matches. So they consulted with technology integrator E+. He's an effort. Then it's win or go home. And Super Bowl 56. And at any moment. For every fan, 